Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fifth virtual meeting of the Historic Districts Review Board. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, applicants, please remember to sign in as attendees. And also, if you're going to be communicating with us by phone, hit star nine. With that being said, I will call this meeting officially to order. Uh, Melissa, may we have a roll call, please? Yes. Chair Rios. Here. Vice Chair Katz. Here and there. <laughs> Member Bookside. Here. Member Bienvenu. Here. Member Guida. Here. Member Larson. Here. Member Roy. And I understand he's excused. Yes, he is. Thank you. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Board members or staff, are there any changes to the agenda? No, Lisa? Any changes? No changes. Any board members? No. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second, please. Second. Uh, thank you, Member Katz and Member Wida. Uh, a roll call vote, please. Yes, uh, Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenu. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. Vice Chair Katz. Yes. Member Larson. Yes. Madam Chair, the motion has been approved. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, we have minutes of the hearing from June the 9th, 2020. Board members, do you have any changes to these minutes? And you know what? Excuse me, I gotta do something. Apologies. Okay, I have member Katz. Yes, on page 12 on the third to last paragraph, the second sentence should read, um, but it makes no difference whether he buys it or not. On the next page, page 13 in the last paragraph, the second se uh, third sentence, with regard to the eight foot high patio sliding doors. And then there's, I think one other, oh, yeah, on page 14, fourth paragraph down, there should be a comma after the word step. Okay, That's all thank I you. have. Thank you. Anything else, Member Katz? No. Uh, any other changes, uh, other members? Uh, I have a couple, Melissa. And the first one okay. is on page 17 at the top of the page. The second sentence should read, the board should also remember that people live in these buildings. Therefore, the board needs to listen closely to the owner's proposals, the people who will be living in the buildings. That's one. Okay. Uh, and all of this is not you, Melissa. It's probably the way I express myself. Sorry. Um, the next one is on page 33. And it's the second paragraph. Chair Rios thought the dollar amount was really low, and then the rest of it is fine. Okay. Uh, third one is on page 41 under board discussion. On the second sentence, just add where it says, but are not recognized, and add under the ordinance. And that is what I have. Uh, is there a motion to approve the uh, minutes as just amended, the minutes of June 9th? No moved. I can. Thank you, Member Katz. And who seconded that? Member Larson. Thank you, Member Larson. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. Um, Member Beachhead? Yes. Member Bienvenu? Yes. Member Guida? Abstain. 
Uh, Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson? Yes. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, findings of fact and conclusions of law. There are seven this evening, board members or staff. Any changes to any of these? <clears throat> It appears that no one has changes. I will entertain a motion and a second, please. Member Benvenu. I move to approve as submitted. Second. second. Thank you, Member Katz. Uh, roll call vote, please. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Benvenu. Yes. Member Guida? Abstain. Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, business from the floor. Any business from the floor? I see two people. I have uh, Fabiola Harford. Fabiola Harford, are you there? You have a hand up? Yeah, I've got to enable speaking. There you go. Okay, let's see. Okay, she has her mic off. Fabiola Harford, uh, will you be speaking this evening under business from the floor? I don't know. Maybe she's someone that's uh, an attendee that will be speaking in reference to a case. I don't, I don't know. Um, in the meantime, I'll call on Stephanie Beninato. Uh, good evening, Stephanie. Good evening, how are you all? Uh, we're doing okay, how about you? Okay, good. I didn't know about the shooting up on uh, on uh, you know, Camino Montesol. It's yeah. kind of surprising. Um, people are going, <laughs> people are definitely going crazy. <laughs> what can you say? Um, so I'm here because again, uh, I looked at your ordinance again, and um, it says the applicant sh for exceptions shall conclusively demonstrate and the board shall make a positive finding of fact that such exemptions comply with the criteria. Now, maybe you could just make a broad finding of fact, but I think when you've had discussion about specific aspects that you really do need to um, talk about why you're doing it. And I say that, and I, I talked about this last week and I've talked about it before, but this time I'm gonna give you some case citation. It's because when you've talked about something and then you either ignore it or vote against your own, what you've just been discussing, you're supposed to present reasons. And if you are dismissing a, a bunch of a, a body of evidence, excuse me, you need to say why you're dismissing it. So um, Miller versus city of Albuquerque. Uh, this was uh, 1976. By failing to comply with its own published procedures, specifically by failing to give reasons for the change, the EPC deprived petitioner of notice and the opportunity to prepare an adequate defense. This was denial of procedural due process. In the matter of protest of Miller, which was 1975, it states, if an administrative board has reached a decision and promulgated an order without reconsidering or considering all the evidence presented at the hearing, the decision and order should be reversed. In Colonius Development Council versus Rhino Environmental Services, it says, without a reason explanation, it appears the secretary ignored an entire line of evidence in reaching his decision on the final order. Allowing the secretary to ignore material issues raised by the parties in this manner would render their right to be heard illusory. It goes on and factors in public testimony when the decision is rendered by giving reasons that show the public that testimony was taken into account. There is another case that I did not cite, but it does talk about you know, when you have discussion and you're kind of leaning in one direction and then you vote in another direction, you are supposed to give some reasoning as to why you're not voting the way you were talking, basically. Um, so I'm just pointing this out to you because these are reversible error. 
And um, the other thing I do want to point out too, because now I see it for a second time, is um, in the exceptions, it says very clearly that one of the criteria is is required to prevent a hardship to the applicant or an injury to the public welfare. If you read that uh, applying the proper English grammar rules, that means you are required that whatever the person wants to do is required to prevent an injury to the public welfare. It's not that it just doesn't injure the public welfare because almost nothing somebody would do on their property unless they create a fire hazard or or pollute the you know the the acacia or the aquifer is going to create an injury. They're not about it's not about creating an injury, it's about preventing an injury. And I really feel that that would be extremely hard to prove that anything somebody does on their residence is going to prevent an injury to the public welfare. And I just want to point it out because it is, it's different and people are, are sliding it over to a different meaning, just like last week when an experienced architect and experienced lawyer said, oh, oh, we didn't know that when you said it was a facade, a primary facade, that you actually meant the whole thing. We really just thought you were talking about the doorway in that facade. I, I, I mean, this is what happens. You just keep pushing it, pushing it. And, you know, again, the standards that apply for most people don't apply to the some one percenters there. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, it appears that we don't have anyone else from the public wishing to make uh, any more uh, comments in reference to business from the floor. Um, next, uh, let me see. Oh, we do have someone. Fabiola Harford, are you there? Okay, I don't. I don't know what's going on with this with this Please, person. Sorry, are you able to try to unmute her? Yeah, I think she's uh, muted. Um, Hello. Yes. I can hear you now. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. This is a this is a brand new computer, and I tried to steal. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, this is the meeting on uh, the hearing that was um, scheduled to address with the issue the issue uh, the current crisis with the historical monuments. The, uh, I'm asking. Uh, excuse me, repeat that again. Is this a special hearing that was set up to address the issue with the historical monuments? No. In, no? No, this, no. We are the Historic Districts Review Board and, uh -huh. and we review and we make decisions on the uh, on cases that come before the board that are located within the districts, the historic districts in Santa Fe? It is my understanding that the mayor referred the case to you guys about uh, his decision on the removal of the monuments. Madam Chair, I, I could possibly offer some clarification. Oh, okay, Lisa. Mayor, and, the, and I'll be speaking to this under communications. The mayor has called for the creation of, an, of a new commission called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which mm -hmm. will be tasked with evaluating monuments throughout the city. Um, but that is not the Historic Districts Review Board. So how that will be like, because reconciliation have nothing to do with cultural heritage and with destruction of, of, of cultural heritage. Um, my concern, I, am, I run an organization that is member of the UNESCO and we, uh, we operate under the UNESCO uh, guidelines for the protection of cultural heritage. And we sent a communication to the mayor uh, before he issued his order, warning him about the situation and the destruction of the, of the, of the monuments as, a, of course, a violation of human rights and as a cultural genocide. That is what we're dealing with right now. Uh, and also warn him about the situation that we were able to identify through social media about these criminal groups acting to destroy the monuments. Uh, we know exactly what the organizations are, what irregular groups that are linked to it. And we were shocked by the mayor's decision to um, 
to cave in to these people that are not even legal uh, organizations. Uh, and I, I just wanted to know what is going to be your role because you have the knowledge, you are the ones that approve the handle, um, whatever happened with those monuments. And I understand everything about reconciliation, understand for human rights, for indigenous rights. But we need to separate here because particularly in the case of these monuments, these monuments are not in Native American lands. These monuments are in the city of Santa Fe, number one. Number two, as you know, the UNESCO guidelines and the United Nations Convention, the, these are decisions that had to be taken in agreement and in consultation with the communities to whom that, that uh, heritage belongs. In this case, it will be the Spaniards, descendants, or any Hispanic person uh, that is member of the community of Santa Fe. And I've seen that your mayor is only considering the Native Americans' uh, opinions, which is also wrong because the Native Americans have their, their, uh, their government authorities and as uh, sovereign nations, any decisions taken that are impact Native American has to be consulted with their tribal authorities. So making any other decision without consultation with the tribal authorities is also a violation from the mayor. So I just wanted to know where you're standing in and what is going to be your role because they have nothing to do with reconciliation, the protection of the cultural heritage. I understand that the city of Santa Fe is have been designated as a creative cultural city for, by the UNESCO. And even when the, United, the, the US said withdraw from the UNESCO, the agreements still stand. So I wanted to know what is going to be your role how you can contribute to the protection of these monuments and the cultural heritage of the citizens of Santa Fe. Uh, Lisa. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, can we go into the communications? Because it seems like sure. said that there were, we were going to, you were gonna be speaking to this. And you know, from, from what I, I heard, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I just, I, I could offer a couple of points of clarification. It looks like we have another member of the audience who would like to speak before we move on to communications. Um, but just briefly to address some of the concerns of Parford, um, my understanding is that the Reconciliation Commission, that the mayor is seeking a, a wide representation of the community of Santa Fe, not strictly um, Native American voices there. Um, so much of, of what is going to happen next remains to be determined. And, and I, I, can, I can guarantee you that there are multiple numerous conversations happening every single day behind the scenes um, and the pathways um, towards um, an answer are, are being explored. I, I will also say that the mayor has not called for the destruction of any monuments. The mayor has called for um, for an exploration of a legal process to... Well, I'm sorry, I understand that the mayor uh, ordered the removal of the monuments. Once ordered... the monuments are touched, as touch or remove, they are not going to be on the original state. He and ordered an exploration know... of the legal process for their removal. He didn't, he didn't state that they shall be removed. He, he stated yes. that they're going to be moving through a legal process and a community process yeah. towards yeah, their- I had a conversation with your, with your chief of police yesterday about um, the destruction, the vandalization of the monuments are, uh, and he told me that he was instructed by higher level not to take action um, and uh, to protect the monuments. Well, I can- That's what he told me. I was involved and, in conversations today. Um, the I hear- I hear the I hear your mayor um, your mayor uh, press address, and um, I'm in the process of waiting for his executive order or the order that he passed. Uh, I reached out to him before he did that, and I expressed him my concern and took I told him that we were to consider the legal avenues to address the situation, and uh, I am preparing in the next days to file a complaint 
and from the United Nations, the international bodies, uh, for violation of human rights and cultural genocide based on the order of your major, uh, because that is exactly, even if he's not being the person directly removing the monuments, once the monuments are being altered, and he and his address, he clearly expressed that he ordered the removal of the monuments. So we are going to take it to the international level so they can address this to the Secretary of the State uh, because some of those monuments are monuments that were, uh, are in the memory of US veterans. And some of them are of course uh, affecting the Hispanic community and the Spaniards descendants, non the Native Americans. They don't own the heritage uh, that is heritage that belongs to the Spaniards Americans on the Hispanic Americans. Uh, those monuments, um, Don Oñate, Don Vargas, that are part of the Hispanic culture, of the Spaniards culture. And what we are witnessing right now is destruction of cultural heritage, it's cultural genocide. And um, we are fixing to take actions, but we wanted to talk to your commission to see if it is something that was being done as of right now. Uh, because so, Ms. I Harford, I really appreciate your comments, and I, this is a really important discussion, and I know it's going to be ongoing in other venues, but this board at this time has not been delegated anything with regard to taking actions or anything like that. So. It's, it's really premature to be requesting from them um, a statement of what they're gonna do. But I really appreciate you bringing this to their attention because this is within a historic district in the plaza. So it is an important issue. I know there will be future conversations. Um, I, I know you can also speak tomorrow night at city council. I think there is a deadline to, to submit petitions to the floor to them. Um, at this point, we're kind of waiting for them to create a new body to consider this and they'll ultimately be making some decisions at that higher level, I think. So I would encourage you to also uh, reach out in that process. I think the deadline is like 8 a.m. tomorrow to um, request to speak during petitions to the floor at city council at seven o'clock tomorrow. So I would okay. encourage well, you to, to we, contact we, them as well, but we really have a big agenda tonight and I think we really do need to move on to our action items, unfortunately, tonight. Thank you and I appreciate your, your, your answer. So Thank we would- so we will be speaking soon. It's thank super you. Super important. Thank you for thank you for being present. Thank you, uh, Sally. Thank you very much for your comments because uh, we do have a large agenda. And yes, we had not been told uh, anything in reference to any action by the H board in reference to the monuments. And you know, as we all know, all of these are very complicated issues uh, that do need to be addressed, and conversations need to take take place. There, we need to have very deep conversations. There are a lot of tentacles in this conversations about the monuments. Um, but I suppose those will take place in the future, which they do have to take place because voices need to be heard to see if we come to some kind of an understanding so that uh, our community lives in peace and harmony. And those are things are happening now right now in the world where things are people want action so anyway uh stephanie beninato uh you have your hand up oh she i guess not no i do uh, i do i do i do and i just want to uh encourage and thank you sally uh, but i want to encourage miss um Hartford to go to petitions from the floor tomorrow and to express herself there because I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be using petitions from the floor and um, you do have to let them know and give them a telephone number but you can go online you'll get the zoom link and um, you'll only have two minutes so you'll have to be concise in uh, what you say but I think it's important that people know that you're going to file a complaint with the UN on um, Alan Weber's dictatorial uh, uh, you know middle of the night uh, movement in, uh, of the uh, or attempt to move that obelisk thank you thank you okay, um, here Yes, Ms. Uh, Harper, you still have your hand up. Uh, did you have something additional to say? No, it appears not. 
Uh, I just want to thank everybody. Um, tomorrow is not going to be because we have some other uh, meetings tomorrow. As I said, we are trying to push a resolution from the top down. Uh, first of all, we have to consider the, the legal framework in this situation. Uh, I do understand and I do understand the component, especially the emotional component for, for many of the, of the people involved. Uh, however, uh, we have a legal framework that should be our guide. Otherwise, we'll have to go and modify the law. But particularly when this is a, is a situation that in the ways that it have been handled, you cannot make agreements or you cannot um, take uh, the word of uh, criminal organizations as face value. We have been tracking on the organization that place the request, their background, and I can assure you with documentations and proof on my hands that those are criminal organizations. Some of those organizations are even requesting donations online, uh, just scamming the public. They are not even registered with your city or with the IRS. Okay, they don't I'm gonna, uh, Ms. Harford, uh, this is the chair of the board, Cecilia Rios. I'm going to again interrupt you, sorry, but this is not the proper forum to have this discussion at this time, okay? And I think that, uh, ooh, I think she just got off, but I hope that you go to the city council chambers where they will have uh, a time for people from the public to speak and make their, uh, make their opinions known. Uh, I am going to move on to communications right now. Uh, Lisa? Um, yes, Madam Chair, this evening we have two communications items. The first item speaks directly to the monuments question. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of, of, a, of an update as to the events of the past week and what the next steps we anticipate will be. So on June 18th, Mayor Weber signed a proclamation of emergency due to civil unrest from institutional racism, calling for the removal of the statue of Don Diego de Vargas from Cathedral Park and the initiation of legal processes for the removal of the soldier's monument, which is also referred to as the obelisk from the Santa Fe Plaza and a determination of a course of action for removal of the Kit Carson obelisk from the Federal Oval. In advance of a protest organized by the Three Sisters Collective, the mayor called on all members of the community to maintain peace and to engage in respectful dialogue about historical trauma and pathways towards peace and reconciliation. The mayor also called for the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as was just mentioned, and is requesting nominations and volunteers to serve on this commission. This commission will be tasked with making recommendations to the uh, this regarding the future of Santa Fe's historic statues and monuments, relevant sections of city code and other matters of education, historic trauma and systemic racism, with, uh, which the city has the responsibility and the opportunity to address in the mayor's words. The protest on Thursday evening proceeded in a peaceful and moving fashion and drew a large crowd and city staff has proceeded to work internally and with state officials to determine the pathways forward with regards to the Plaza Obelisk, which was heavily vandalized over the weekend. Presently, the city is considering the option of temporarily removing the wrought iron fencing around the monument and or installing temporary plywood fencing around its base under the authority of the land use director and in compliance with chapter 14. These proposed actions would provide an opportunity for public art and community dialogue regarding the meaning and the future of the obelisk and we'll also pro provide a degree of protection against future vandalism of the monument until a course of action um, can be determined for its legal removal. So that is the first item of communication that I wanted to bring to you guys this evening. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions if I can, to the degree that I can. So much of what's going on right now is still uncertain and to be determined um, but there are, there are, as I said, conversations going on extensively every day. Thank you. Um, Member Benvenu has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, Lisa, I just had a question. Okay. Separate from the commission that 
that Mayor Weber is appointing, what is the jurisdiction of the board over the monument in the plaza, in your opinion? Um, as I understand the way that, that, that chapter 14 operates in this context, the, the monument in the plaza is a designated significant structure. And so um, alterations, permanent alterations to that monument, I believe would have to go through the historic districts review board as part of the city's process of complying with chapter 14 of its code. Okay. There in all legal context in which we have to, to um, navigate including the, the designation uh, of the plaza, including the, the monument as a national historic landmark and as listed on the state and national registers of, of historic places. So there are, there are historic, there are national and state designations that, that we are operating within too, and um, as well as the, the, the historic status as assigned by chapter 14. Okay, so in your opinion, then no alterations could be done to the monument without first obtaining approval from this board? I believe that that is true. There, uh, There's still a lot of dialogue going on behind the scenes to that effect. So I believe that no permanent alterations could happen without the input of this board. And okay. also in reference to that, no, I'm sorry, Member Benvenu. Were no, you thank you. That was, that answered my question. I appreciate that. If uh, Lisa, if what you have just stated is accurate, then the moving of the docu of the monument uh, could not be done by by the mayor's office or by the uh, correct. I'm I'm still waiting on more guidance from the city attorney and who's in who is also in consultation with the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, legal counsel as well. So they're, they're having conversations about the proper legal process and I will update this board as to um, what that process is as soon as I receive more information. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't know, we're living under very complicated circumstances lately and if uh, these issues that are very complicated are happening, I don't know if they, if for instance, if they would give the mayor a waiver or whatever under the circumstances. I do not know, but I guess you are, uh, maybe in the future will talk to us about that. Yes, Madam Chair, of course. Uh, any other questions or comments? Okay, it appears not. So there's another item of communications oh, yes, this please. evening as well, Madam Chair, um, and I'm going to invite, I'll, I'll give a, a brief intro and I'm gonna to invite Tom Easterson Bond to join us on the panel. So June, on June 3rd was the first convening of the mayor's task force on the reopening of the plaza. Um, and Fallen Colors, who are the owners of the white building, as you may recall from a recent case before this board, presented the idea of social distance metering of the plaza and other potential congregate areas as a way to create safety and trust. And Falling Colors then contacted Tom Easterson Bond for a specific design concept. Um, his company, Wood Metal Concrete, provided the first draft of a concept of metering using clouds, which Falling Colors presented on June 11th to the task force. Um, the task force enthusiastically adopted and the idea, and, and the following week on June 18th, Falling Colors presented the idea of its sponsorship of materials wood metal concrete pro bono ex executable design and guidance and with J.M. Evans as sponsoring labor. The Downtown Alive Task Force, as it is referred to, adopted the concept and is in the process of seeking approvals from various necessary city authorities to move forward with the concept. Um, the, this proposal is also under consideration for approval by the land use director as a temporary installation in response to the public health crisis and as a measure to reactivate the plaza for economic development and community gatherings. So I'm gonna to invite Tom to give us a little bit of an intro to this concept that is under consideration now. And so I'll move to, um, Tom, are you there? Lisa, thank you very much. I am here, can you hear me? Sure thing, yes. 
I'm going to move to full screen mode. Great. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, staff, um, thank you. Lisa, would you like me to just ramble on as quickly as I can? I know you've got a lot on the agenda tonight. Sure, um, if you could just give us an overview, that would be great. And I've got the, the um, exhibits that you provided. So I'll just, I can just move through those if you want to give us, give per us a little Perfect. Bit. I'll cue you this context. next slide quickly. Sure. So thank you. As you know, I'm, I'm doing some work downtown and I appreciate your patience with the last presentation. Um, I was contacted by Falling Colors in a way and a desire to sort of activate the plaza a bit more in a non-permanent fashion. And one of the one of the parks that was done in San Francisco, as you may know, is Dolores Park, where there was a, a series of rings created that was sort of a beautiful aerial image. And when Falling Colors approached me, I said, how can we make this uniquely Santa Fe? And you can see, always inspired by Georgia Keefe's work, um, her Sky Above the Cloud series provides a quick glimpse into how social distancing separation and creating a series of clouds on the plaza would work. And Lisa, maybe you can flip to the next slide. Thank you. So you can see the picture of Dolores Park and there is a, a level of comfort and safety sort of that is provided with a eight foot separation and a 10 foot circle. It, it allows a way for people to define themselves on the plaza a bit. And, and the way to sort of what we thought about making it Santa Fe was to create a series of clouds that would uh, be distributed throughout the benches and the areas of the plaza so that people would feel comfortable staying. They could sit and watch a music venue it would be a way to sort of open up the plaza safely. And I've been down there a bunch and I think there is some confusion. And I think creating boundaries and guidelines is always a good way for people to function. And you can slip, flip to the next slide. So we banned just by mapping the plaza itself and creating essentially that same Dolores Park model over the plaza with this sort of base grid of clouds. At least you can flip to the next one. Sure. Like, um, and what we then did was map around the park obstacles. And you can see a quick sketch there of how a park bench would function at, with a cloud around it. We'd be using um, sort of non-toxic field marking paint that is meant to be temporary, but could provide a sort of beautiful white space to which to operate. And next slide, Lisa. And here's a quick sketch of just seeing an, an axometric. We went out and measured, of course, and set the plaza and set all the light posts. So we feel pretty good about this map and sort of creating walking paths, but then still cloud spaces where people could operate. And then next slide. And this is the, the rendering model gives it a little bit better feel. Um, certainly the trees are not shaped like the trees we have out there, but this gives a base plane where you could see there's enough space for people to operate and move on the paths, but for a bandstand function, for a place to operate. And the goal would be to create a series. This would be the first step that there would be a way to develop um, merchant clouds. This could be applied to the restaurants as they move out into the space where they could be given tables that are cre created on different color clouds. It would also be a way for us to get um, vendors out on the plaza expanded a little bit and defined space without being crowded under the portal. Um, next slide. Thank you, Lisa. And so here's just kind of idea of seeing people on the plaza. And I think it, again, just seeing how Dolores Park operated and reading that and seeing how people are operating now, it gives us that, that use of space. And I also think it's incredibly fun um, and I think it's something that we could use right now as a downtown activity where we're making an idea about social distancing uniquely Santa Fe. And, and that's where uh, functioning as a tourist and visitor destination, we can give something people to visit and see at the plaza and remain safe. So that in a quick nutshell, nutshell as quick as I can, that's the essential idea of sort of mapping the plaza with these with these social distancing clouds. Okay, thank you, Mr. Easterson, for your presentation. Um, I'm wondering, are who all besides 
coming to the H board, who all is going to oversee the project or who all has to give their stamp of approval? Uh, Lisa, do you know the answer to that? Um, Madam Chair, I'm not totally sure about that yet. Um, this, this idea is very new and we're working through what the process is. Um, it is it is being considered as um, as a temporary treatment, temporary reversible treatment that the land use director could administratively approve. Um, but the the purpose of bringing the the idea forward to you guys tonight is to um, invite your feedback and comments on on this treatment, um, so that so that you have that opportunity for input. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, are these clouds going to be of different sizes or are they going to be of one? Obviously, if it's around a bench, it's got to uh, be, you know, surround the bench. So depending on the size of the bench, but all the other ones that I'm seeing here on this grassy areas, Mr. Easterson, are, will they be of the same size, different sizes? Um, Madam Chair, they're, they're all essentially the same relative area so that the social distancing needs can be met. So a small cluster of four to five people can, can operate on that. And then the, I think it's important to sort of vary the shape of the cloud that we'd sort of create a model with four distinct clouds with stenciling that could be done easily by volunteer crews that again, temporary paint these on the plaza um, and, the, and the ground. So there'd be slight, slight distortions of the shape but essentially there'd be four typologies of cloud that would remain similar. It's, we don't wanna sort of randomly produce <laughs> a line around it. We do wanna leave a sort of guideline, a very specific shape. Clouds are, I spent a little too much time with clouds over the last few days. I think that they, they, <laughs> there's a certain methodology of the drawing of the outline that let, it lets it retain itself as a cloud, but also look, wow, that's really interesting. And I see it as a cluster. So they're essentially all the same size. Okay. Are these cumulus clouds? I'm just kidding. I'm going to answer <laughs> I'm that question. I'm totally kidding you. <laughs> I'm going to answer is that they're inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe clouds from that sense. Okay, let me see. Uh, Member Larson, you have the yeah. floor. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm really happy that we are discussing this um, and that you've brought it to us to the view. Um, I think that it just to continue our discussion of how art exists in historic districts and how we can reinforce human presence and actual community presence in historic districts um, is a really important discussion to keep having. And um, I think that this is a really creative way that, um, that we can, again, just reinforce that the plaza belongs to the community and that it can continue to be used even during the pandemic and during these, these unforeseen circumstances. So, um, so I, really, I really like this idea. I think it's a really um, positive um, idea in, in this time. So uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited that it's reversible and that we can start exploring that and maybe using more reversible um, ideas throughout our district, not just in the plaza area where um, you know, it's, it's a high traffic area, but maybe in, in different areas as well. And having our community engage um, beyond just that, that central district. So yeah, um, really, I, I'm excited to hear what everyone else thinks. And um, I hope that this happens. Thank you, Member Larson. Uh, Member Katz, you have the floor. Thank you. I think it's brilliant and I think it's beautiful. And I think it's very much needed. It's been distressing to watch the increase of tourists in town that are going around without any masks and sort of seemingly disregarding safe procedures. And I hope, hope that this will help. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you, Member Katz. Member Benvenu? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would, I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful project. It seems, I guess my only concern is just the very idea that it really needs our approval. It seems like a temporary um, art project, more or less. And I'd hate to think that 
the things that we do and enforcing those historic <laughs> ordinance would prohibit something like that. I don't know if it normally would, um, but it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that would easily fit within the guidelines as a temporary art project. And we would want to encourage all through the historic districts without needing exceptions or other approval from this particular body. So that's my only comment. I'm all in favor otherwise. Thank you, Member Benvenu. Uh, I would like to hear from the other board members. Member Guida. Um, I think it's a fantastic proposal. I'm I'm 100% behind it. I think it's a very strong idea. And I agree with Member Larson that this is the type of stuff that we should be pursuing in the historic districts. Thank you. Uh, Member Beachside. Yeah, what, what a great idea. This is a fantastic way to let people know it's okay to be on the plaza, to welcome them back, and to also manage um, the, the out of town guests that we see in the summer, especially in the plaza. Um, great work, and I fully support it. Okay, thank you. Did I get everybody? I hope I did. Uh, Member Bevan, you, you have your hand up? Sorry. Okay. It's coming down. Um, and uh, to Lisa, I guess, uh, is there a timeline on this? Are they going to do it? Madam Chair, I'm not, I'm not totally sure of the timeline. Um, I do want to just reiterate that, that the, we brought this to you tonight, not for your, not for your approval per se, but, but for your feedback, because it's important as, as, as a board who, um, who, who frequently, regularly explores matters of, of historic spaces and, and um, treatments to historic spaces to, to weigh in on this project. So thank yeah. you for- thank you. And because this is a national, the Plaza is a national historic landmark. Uh, I think that we probably, our voices should be heard in reference to this. Uh, and I think you heard it Everybody <laughs> in favor. I think it's uh, uh, a good project. And the, the plaza needs to stay alive, correct? So um, if nobody has anything else to say, to, is uh, Mr. Is Tom still there? I think he left. No, I'm still there. here, thank oh, you. Okay. Tom, uh, did, I hope you don't mind me calling you Tom. Do you want- No, uh, please. You seem like a very friendly guy. I feel like I know you. <laughs> oh yeah, from a project that came before us. Uh, did you have anything else to tell us? No, thank you for your comments. I think the uh, we're trying to move as quickly as we can, and I think it's it's very complicated, as you know, to to move through this. But uh, your support and um, kind words about moving forward with enlivening the plaza is what we need. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. So we are going to move on to action items, and ladies and gentlemen, we have seven of them, and I do need to tell. Uh, applicants or anybody that is listening that we do have, if you disagree with the decision that this board renders this evening, you do have the option to appeal to the city council. There are time constraints involved. And so you need to get together with city staff and that the time constraints involve the approval of the findings and the conclusions. And you'll have 15 days after those have been approved to file your appeal. Uh, with that being said, we will go to the first case this evening. And the first case is Angela's case. And Madam Chair, it is 2020-002174. And it's located at 104 Lorenzo Road. And uh, Angela, I don't know, in, on the cover sheet, it says contributing. And on uh, the report on the summary, it says, uh, I mean, on the summary, it says contributing. And on the cover sheet, it says non-contributing, but I'm sure you will uh, clarify that for us. And we will hear your report, please. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask that the applicant please raise their hand from the attendee list so that I know who to move to the panel? Yeah, please do. Raise your hand uh, if you are the next uh, applicant that's going to be speaking in reference to this case. You need to put yourself under the attendees list so that we can know who you are. Oh, also, yes, Lisa. So just uh, just a reminder to use your raise hand button. If you can see that, I'm, I'm guessing that this applicant is L.O. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, Lance. Can we move that applicant over to the panel just to see. Oh, okay. And I also have uh, to ask Sally for a favor. Sally, uh, in reference to public comment, I would like to limit that to two minutes. Uh, would you let me and the whoever's speaking uh, know when the two minutes are up? Yes, Is that okay? I'm ready to go. I've got my timer up and I will try to politely uh, alert folks. Okay. Politely and timely. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Can we ask the to just confirm that that is because we can't proceed without the applicant present, so we need to know. Okay. So the applicant's the applicant. still is not present. Okay. Well, we don't know. Is it L O? Are you the applicant? And if so, please say. Hi. No, I'm here for twelve ten. Okay. My apologies. Uh, oh, okay. That's oh, a good guess. Oh. Initials. If you are call, if you are a calling attendee, please press star nine to raise your hand. Otherwise, you should have a raise hand button within your participants. Lance Olivier. It, it would be Lance and Irene Olivier. Uh, well, what we might have to do is put them at the end of the agenda if they're not here for the meantime. I mean, if they're not here, we got to go forward, right? Right. Um, so, Madam Chair, we could, the board could choose to, to table the case until the applicant arrives. That's uh, fine with me. Is there uh, a motion? Pardon me? Perhaps Angela could reach out to the applicant off, off camera to, to make sure that they know how to participate because there is sure. a technical challenge with these, these hearings. So, Of course. Okay, in the meantime, Angela, I, I think I'm gonna entertain a motion to table till the applicants are present. So if you can call them and um, I will entertain a motion to uh, put this case, uh, to postpone this case until the applicants get here. Uh, Member Vendigny. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. In the case of 2020-2174-104 Lorenzo Road, I move to table until the applicants are present. Thank you, Member Benvenu. Uh, second, please. Second. Uh, second. Uh, Member Rita seconded. And a roll call vote, please. Melissa. Melissa, are you there? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that, Madam Chair. Oh, that's um, okay. Can we have a roll call vote, please, in reference to this motion today? Yes. Um, Member Beachscheid? Yes. Member Benvenu? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. Oh. Vice Chair? Yes. <laughs> Member Larson? Yes. The motion has been approved. Uh, thank you very much. Then we're gonna move to the next case on the agenda, which is Daniel's case. And it's 2020-001784. It's located at 339 and 341 Plaza Valentin. Uh, this is presently a contributing building and this is for a historic status review. Daniel, may we hear your report, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to note at the beginning, um, you have a staff report and I've been working to synchronize the staff reports with the slideshow that we're gonna be showing. Um, so I'll be asking Lisa to um, proceed through the slides, hopefully, so that you can follow the the visual presentation with um, with what I'm going to be reading. Okay. Okay. So 339 uh, to 41 Plaza Valentine is a residential structure with contributing historic status in the downtown and east side historic district. On April 28th, 2020, the HDRB heard an application for a review of status and designation of primary facades and elected to postpone before reaching a decision in order to that a complete historic cultural properties inventory could be produced. That HCPI has now been prepared and is presented today along with this application. Next slide. Lisa, yeah. So the house was designated, was designed by Kate Muller Chapman, a well-known early female architect in Santa Fe. It was built in 1924 using traditional methods carried out by local 
and native Pueblo artisans who are experts in adobe construction. It was the first original house Kate Chapman built in the neighborhood and was the start of what would be become recognized as the Plaza Valentine residential compound. That's what you see here on the slide, which was developed during the 1920s and 30s. The compound began with four small houses, reached 10 by 1940, and the small scale of the compound is best preserved in the southern portion, which is uh, to the right of the screen, um, accessed via Sequia Madre, of which this house is a part. Uh, next slide. This is a, a historic photo of the house. Um, the house has one representative symmetrical facade facing west, that's this facade, with wings at the sides <clears throat> and a portal in the middle. A historic photograph uh, of the house shows that the basic form of this facade is still intact. It also retains several details, including the original angular corbels, which you can see um, in the photo, designed by Chapman and the two doors and the left window under the portal. The territorial revival brick coping, which is not in the photo, but it was added later, you'll see that later, um, was added probably uh, before 1985. Uh, next slide. So this is the original uh, floor plan in, the, in pink. Uh, there have been various additions to the rear portion of the house, which I'm going to get through now. Next slide. Number one, a closet addition on the northeast corner, pre-1975. Next. A kitchen addition on the east facade between 2008 and 2011. Next. A bedroom, carport, and garage on the southeast corner between 1975 and 85. Next. A coyote fence on the west perimeter. It is thought that this is pro that possibly possibly earlier picket fence was in this location, um, as several other of Chapman's projects employed one. Next. Finally, uh, bathtub addition um, on that um, south corner. So uh, the, very, the windows are of a mixed condition and date are descri described in a table that is in your packet. I'm not gonna go through all of those. Um, <clears throat> go to the next slide. I just want to draw your attention to um, the front, this uh, representative facade in particular and the changes that have been made to it. So the first alteration, alteration one, <clears throat> on the left wing, the window opening appears to have been partly patched to construct a smaller window, as you can see on the lower part of the picture. Next. The original window under the left portion of the partal is still in extant and in good condition. Only large pane storm windows have been tacked in front of this historic divided light window. Next. On the right portion under the portal, the historic French doors with divided lights have been filled in at the bottom and the upper portion has been made into a large pane horizontal window. Next. On the right wing, the pedimented trim has been removed and a large modern pane window has been inserted. Other windows on the north and south elevations are also non-historic, as I mentioned, there's a table. The front door appears also to be original, as well as windows under the facades. Um, the staff recommendation, that's the end of the slideshow, um, recommends uh, that the status be designated as, as significant uh, due to its um, relative integrity and uh, association with the architect. Um, because there have been various non-historic additions to the structure, staff recommends that these non-historic portions be excluded from the primary facades. That's my report. I stand for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, John, for your thorough report. Uh, so this, this place has two addresses, 339 and 341. Uh, can you tell us why the two addresses? That's... A good question, and I, I believe that the applicant will be able to speak to it a little bit better. I think that maybe um, it was too, 
two units at one time. I'm not sure of the exact reason. Um, okay. And you know what? I read, interestingly enough, that this was a school at one time. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first, its first use. Yeah. And this is 96 years old, correct? And um, would you say that also you're putting emphasis on the on it becoming significant because it's association with uh, the people that live there since it has had a lot of alterations there is from what I understand there is a footprint but that footprint is basically surrounded by a lot of alterations that have taken place in more recent times is that correct there are um we went through the alterations. I mean, I think you can you can see the original structure fairly clearly, especially in the front, which is the representative part of the structure. There are obviously alterations, but they're distinguishable, and um, I don't think that they damage the the character of the of the building. Yeah, it's um, also in reference to the French doors there in the uh, the entry under the yeah. portal. Uh, what did you yeah. say about those? Well, you can see there are French doors in that picture. And if you go down a few slides um, towards the end, they have that, those French doors. Yeah, this is, if you look at that lower picture, that's where the French doors were. They've been filled in. Oh, okay. Okay. So the lower picture is what is there presently. Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and so each of those slides shows the historic design the, and and what it looks like today so that's the french doors as, as they appear today oh. maybe lisa you just want to go back up through slowly so that they can um the chair can so that's you can see that that window below is yeah. essentially the same probably the, the original window mm -hmm. um go up one more please and yeah. you can't see the window on the left but it is presumed that it's the same design as on the right um, on the right wing of the building, there's a, a, a tall window, with pedimented trim, and below it appears that that opening was made smaller. Okay. That there was originally an uh, identical window on the left and the right side. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, Member Katz has a question. Member Katz? Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly appreciate the desire to make this building significant because of the historical connection, because of that beautiful west facade. But I'm wondering what the words high level of historic integrity mean. Um, we are excluding facades 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13, and half of 14 and 15. That's a lot of exclusion from historic protection appropriately because they're not within the historic period, but that certainly questions, raises the question of whether this really should be significant in that sense because so many of the facades are, are not gonna be primary facades. Uh, thank you, Member Katz. Uh, Member Larson? Yeah, I have a comment and a question for Daniel. Um, the comment is, I, I think when we're assessing for um, association with a person that um, a general rule of thumb that I think works really well is to think if that person visited this house today, would they recognize that it was theirs? Would they recognize that it was their house? And I think in this case, yes, like Daniel said, we have a significant amount of fabric here. And um, so yes, I, I do think that it would be recognizable. Um, and my question is, Daniel, could you just re reiterate what the period of significance is with, with that occupant, um, the year that she well, just, yeah, just reiterate, please, the, the period of significance that you designated. I didn't get a chance to read the report, but I would appreciate if you could just let me know. I, I had said that, the, that I would regard it as significant because of its association with the architect. The period in um, which 
I would say that that the the significance of the house really was developed was the 1920s through the 1940s. Okay, thank you both. And yeah, it's, the it's due to that. Just... The compound was being developed by Kate Chapman and her associates. Great, thank you. Thank you. Member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Daniel, just for my clarification, I'm not finding, and I'm sure it's just me, where is the recommendation on primary facades or what is your recommendation? Um, I did not go through a number of the facades that I thought should be excluded or included. Um, I, I made a general recommendation that the board consider to remove or to not include the facades where non-historic additions have been made. No, normally, so you'd have to use this um, this um, diagram as a guide to make that determination. What about a public visibility? Is it is it, one and two the publicly visible portion? Yes, one and two are visible. Six is somewhat visible. That that south uh, southwest corner is visible. The rear um, portions fourteen fifteen. 10, 11, 9, 8, 7, those are all not visible. And what about four and five? Um, where is oh, they're not on you. Well, yeah, let me just see here. It's between three and six. Four, that, yeah, four, four is part of that front. It's behind the tree, but it is okay. to technically publicly visible. Um, five extends back. Uh, it includes a, what we would call a bump out. You know, it's not it is visible, yes. Okay. This I yeah, you know, I'm familiar with this road. It isn't that a private road actually, not a city road that it's on. Yes, that's I'm correct. Not. So the I guess technically none of it is publicly visible. If that's true, then that would be correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, before I go to member uh, Rita, John, I mean uh, Daniel. Could you please uh, re, uh, tell us which of the facades are would be excluded in reference to the numbers? Well, um, it would if I start on the left, it would include portions of 14 and 15 and 13, 11, 10, 9, 7, 6, portions of five. Those are the ones that would be exclude. Those would be yes. non-historic. Yes, the ones that are not touched by a by the pink block. Okay, which thank are you. in some cases portions of a facade. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Guida. Um, Guida, thanks, you have the thanks, floor. Thanks for um, for the report. Um, I'm happy to see that that. Um, that a historic report was written on the property. I'm, I'm glad to see this property elevated. I agree uh, in general with, with uh, your recommendation uh, for, uh, for designating this as significant. And more so that, that you know, so much of, of the original building remains visible and intact that it makes a certain amount of sense to, uh, to identify the original structure and, and, and possibly exclude these additions that you outlined. Um, from what I can see, you know, the, the, the additions are noted in most cases pre-1985. Do we have photographs of, of any of these additions? Do we know, you know, if, if it's pre-1985, it's possible that it could be historic. It's possible that it could be of good quality. Is there anything in the report or photos that, that indicate yeah, I mean quality of this material? The diagram gives um, spans. Mm -hmm. So, and it is, it's visible in the report of, on page four um, and possibly this page 19 has a better um, production, better, more readable production. So for example, the garage is post 1975. Okay. The kitchen is from 2008 to 11. The closet edition is pre 1975. The bathtub edition is post 1985. So, um, there, with the extent, with the 
exception of the closet, they are post 1975. Got it. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Um, how would, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, what we're, what we're being asked here to do is to, it, it seems like a sensible path that, um, that the building should be designated as significant because of its association with the architect and because of, uh, uh, because these, these historic features are intact. Um, our task is probably to square that with the with our ordinance, which is very dependent on facades and details and actual uh, uh, elements. And I'm wondering how, you know, besides saying, you know, well, exclude these additions, how do we think about other, how do you recommend that we think about or state um, <coughs> finding uh, relative to windows? Is it, do we just say not the historic additions and not the non-historic? Um, windows is that the approach here or, or are we going to look at this facade by facade exclude the brick coping or you know th those are the questions i have how do how do we square this with the way that we typically do things well i let i'd like to hear what lisa has to say that in general the definition or the the practice of dealing with this significant structure is to consider all facades primary. The code doesn't actually define a, a significant building that way, but that's the way that the board has historically treated a significant building. So. Can I make an observation? Absolutely. Okay. Um, we were looking at this earlier today and we were reviewing the provisions in 14.5.2 D um, general design standards and specifically with uh, windows, doors and other architectural features, the code does treat significant and landmark structures differently um, than contributing in that when you're dealing with uh, significant structures you apply the sort of extra limitations that you would apply to a primary facade of a contributing structure to the entire structure. So regardless of whether the board were to designate a particular facade as a primary facade on a significant building, you would still have the limitations on the removal of historic window and door material, uh, historic architectural features. All of those uh, details would need to be um, repaired if possible, replaced in kind if repair is impossible, regardless of what facade you're on. And so in that sense, the code really does treat all of the facades as primary when you're dealing with a significant structure. But when you look at other portions of D9, like the additions section, where it talks about making additions to primary facades, that, that one doesn't really uh, make a distinction between a significant structure and a primary facade of contributing structure in the same way. So I, I think just, just to kind of keep in mind that in terms of those types of historic uh, windows, doors, features, those would need to be preserved regardless of any designation, but there's potentially other code provisions that might be triggered by designating certain facades as primary. Whoa. That's a lot of words, I know. We were looking at this no, earlier though, in terms of how do we get to this you know, interpretation that all facades of a significant structure are primary. The code does treat them that way for certain provisions. No, that's okay. So when I think of a significant building, it is all facades are primary. But in this case, it's a 96 year old building that is very well preserved, but it is surrounded by a lot of facades that are that don't fall into the uh, category of of uh, historicity as the uh, ordinance defines it. You know, there, uh, if it's as close as 1970, that's 50 years. But if it's, if it's after 1970, or, you know, if it's close to 1970, maybe one thing, but you're talking about a very old building that is really surrounded by a lot of, that is a very unique building and that the building itself that is historic, in my view, should be preserved. But I'm trying to 
see what transpires in this particular case in reference to all of these portions of the building that are not historic. And uh, I'm having turmoil in my head about that. In Madam to that. Yes. Could I offer some thoughts that might, that might help you frame it? Please. And I know there's other members of the, the board who, who would like to speak. So if they would rather speak first, I'm, I'm happy to defer. Okay, uh, Member Katz. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. From what Sally said, uh, the strictures against removing historic material from any facade or every facade of a significant building would obtain. But the point is that all of those facades that I originally listed and that Daniel repeated, um, that's not historic material because it's not historic. So you can, they're, they're not, they're maybe a primary facade, but they're not historic. So they could be completely changed. I'm not sure that they are primary facades by our code. I, I think that they reservation requirements, but I believe that pr the primary facade designation is limited to contributing buildings. There's, Lisa, we had looked in the code and not found any provision that says that primary facades, uh, that all facades on a significant structure are primary. There's, there is that, there is no clause in the code that says that. It does, however, say that there are preservation standards requirements to retain historic materials and features that apply to all facades of, of, of significant structures. So there's, it's a little bit of a, a, a matter of, of splitting hairs and, and, and definitions. Um, effectively, all facades of a significant structure are primary, but with, with some limitations on that, I, I, I would say. And Sally could weigh in. Okay, but I'm kind of agreeing, I am agreeing with Frank, because if you have, if you made this building significant, then uh, some of these uh, facades have materials within them that are not uh, historic, so those could be changed. Yes, that's right. Okay, let me, let me hear from other members. Now for change. Uh, Okay, Member Guida. I, I just uh, had two points to make here. And Madam Chair, uh, with all due respect, I don't believe that the building is surrounded by changes. I think um, the sheet that Daniel highlighted on, on, uh, on page 19 uh, makes clear the dates of these additions. And the only one that would even come close to being 50 years old is the closet edition um, on the north uh, west corner, if I'm correct there, or southwest corner. Um, and, uh, and the rest are post 1975 and some are quite recent. Um, the, the, the original building that, that's being proposed to be declared significant is, is mostly exposed there have been there have been some changes but the majority of the original facades are exposed there's only these very minor additions or if they're bigger additions they they touch the building only in a minor way so so the notion that it's surrounded i don't think is is correct um, and i think it would be very easy to say uh that that these non-historic additions should not be included second point would be uh is a question to daniel is the is the brick coping um, a historic feature? I'm just looking it up, I believe it says in the report. Uh, before 1985, um, I got that from the HCPI. I will have a look to see if I can narrow that date from the HCPI. Okay. Cool, thank you. I was looking that up. Could I just offer a quick thought a quick thought regarding what I what I consider the building's significance aside with aside from some from simply its association with Kate with Kate Chapman. I, I think that this this home represents um, 
a very early example of, of the development of Santa Fe style. It was it was modeled after the Roque Lovato House, um, which was one of the one of the very you know shining examples, the very earliest examples of Santa Fe style um, in 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 the city. And I think for that reason alone, it's 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 a really important house. So it's not just its association with Kate Chapman, it's also its association with the development of this idea of Santa Fe style, which was happening in the 1920s. Thank you. On uh, Daniel, on yes. what we have up on the screen right now, can you point out what is closest to the uh, original footprint? Yes, what- uh, the, the, what pink, the pink block is the original footprint. And that includes all of this facade one. I just want to be clear that this is the oh, portal. okay. This okay. is the portal. So all of this is 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 original. Okay. Okay. I'm getting a better picture now. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what that means is that the front, aside from that little bump out on the right, is entirely exposed, so to speak, the original exposed structure. It is only in the rear, except for that one little bump out that you have these additions. Okay, thank you. That's, I'm, I'm getting a better picture. Thank you very much. You. Member Guida, uh, did you finish? Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Larson. Thank you, yes. Um, I'd also like to point out, um, I think it's really important that we can still see the outlines of the original French door. Um, they've left, you know, a complete trace of where that original window was, where that door was. Um, it's all distinguishable from what we see currently. And also, I think that um, I, I agree with all of Anthony's comments. Um, I, I think that we're, and, and Lisa's comments, that we're looking at something that is quite exceptional and that it's a, an, an example of a female architect's work um, in Santa Fe. And I, I think that alone can, you know, help us to focus more on, on what is there and less so on the additions. Again, this is a recognizable building that, you know, it, it, it still has a significant amount of integrity from those, those primary facing facades. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Member Katz? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to assure you, the first thing that I said is that I agree that this is a significant building. My point is that there are a whole bunch of facades on that building that would not be protected by that status period. But don't worry, I'm not saying it's not significant. <laughs> All out. Thank you everybody for making your voices heard on this. Um, I was questioning myself. I had already decided when I read my packet that I felt that it was significant. And then when all of this is coming to light, I wasn't quite sure. I think that I am now, uh, I want to make sure that this building is stays significant. We'll hear from the applicant. And I think that even the applicant was enthusiastic about getting having this uh, become a significant building. Also, another association with this building is an artist that was here, Jesse Newsbaum. He was, uh, he also lived in this building. Uh, but if no one has anything else to say, I will call on the applicant to get sworn in. Uh, Lisa, the applicant here. I have moved one of the applicants over, Madam Chair. Is, is there another applicant that wishes to be promoted to the panel? Please raise your hand if so. Okay, we have John. Hello. There we go. Hello. Okay, just a minute. Hi. Um, I don't see anyone has there. Uh, we have John and Elizabeth. I have John. Karen, Karen Marsh. And Karen, okay, I'll move Karen. She didn't have her hand up, sorry. Okay, thank you. Now I see that Karen Marsh has her hand up and now I see, let's see, okay. Now I do not see it. <laughs> I've moved her to the panel, Madam Chair. That's okay. what. Yeah, I don't see her there. But anyway, uh, Melissa, would you share uh, swear in the applicant? 
Um, yes. Please, um, do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Karen, Marv, hello? Applicant? Karen and John are both muted. It appears if you can try to unmute yourselves. Yes, I do. And can you see me now? Oh, there we go. Yes. Uh, so Liz, Liz is also trying to raise her hand. She's she's put a chat in. Liz is the owner. Okay. I think we can see Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. Karen, that's, that's, that's actually me. I'm Karen. Oh, I'm at the top, Karen. If you. Can oh, okay. And we've got John unmuted too. If, if Elizabeth and John are going to speak, you could uh, go ahead and be sworn in too if you'd like this time. You want me to swear them all in together? <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Now that we've got everybody unmuted. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, great. Here, do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies you're about to give are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Yes. 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 Thank you. And when you speak, could you please state your full name and address for the record? Thank you, Melissa. Who will be speaking first? I have one thing to say. I'm John Barton. I wrote the HIPKEY report on this beautiful property. The uh, territorial detailing, uh, we were able to identify from a previous HIPKEY that was done in 1985 and the, the brick coping was apparent then so it's pre-1985 the territorial brick coping okay thank you um next who will be speaking um i'm i'm karen marsh yes you have to I'm, I'm i'm liz's architect and I, I, that's all okay uh you heard staff's report and you heard all the comments made by board members uh, do you agree that this home should be designated as significant? I, I would agree, but not all the facades. Okay. Um, and what ben, about the- Can I speak? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to say that I think that the primary facade, the original facade, in my opinion, is significant. And it's not only significant because of um, the architecture and the, the architect and that it was the beginning of Plaza Valentine, but it's kind of also the story of the house and the story of all the people who came together kind of who influenced the house um, because it was, uh, there were various kind of uh, people in and around um, uh, Kate Chapman, who had a lot of influence, which would be like Sylvanus Morley, who was in the Lobato house, and how he had changed the windows of his house. And those, when she developed this house or designed this house, that was like a really important um, feature to open up the windows instead of having the small, small windows that were the traditional design. And then uh, the various people who moved in and out of the house, like Jesse Nussbaum. Uh, and then uh, there was a very unusual uh, school that was the original um, occupants of the house. And it was, it included another artist who was not as well known, but fairly interesting. Uh, and his name was Kaluzi. And uh, he was a, a, from New York and made masks for the theater and was a teacher at the school that had, it was a very progressive school. And Mary Austin was very involved in the school. And so she was a visitor to the house also and, and spoke there and led seminars. Um, and then, uh, another significant person who was there uh, was uh, Arthur Morgan, who was the editor of um, the New Mexican, um, the paper, and then um, also 
read the introduction to a history of Santa Fe book by Oliver Lafarge. So there were kind of these interesting characters kind of in and out of it. And it was originally just that pink section that you've seen uh, that was the original house. And then these additions were added when the owners of the house turned it into a duplex so that they could rent you know, each side of the house. Um, and those additions are kind of uh, behind the original facade. So it's not like they're prom. Oh, we just lost your voice. We just lost you. Ooh, we've lost. Ooh, where did she go? Uh, Ms. Beal or Bell? Uh, you just um, lost your voice. I'm, this is Karen. I'm going to text her. Oh, okay. She may be having connectivity issues. In the meantime, she was just about to mention why there are two addresses, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, please. Um, when they made it into a duplex, that's when they added the extra address. Yeah. Okay. Oh, she's back, I think. Looks like she's back. Uh, no, she's still frozen. Oh. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is very interesting history on this house. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Good. Yes. Okay, anyhow, just to make a long story short, my intention is not to alter the original. My intention is to bring it or restore it to that original picture that you see with, with original features or as close to as possible um, reproductions of those. And then with the, the uh, back part of it that has the additions to match those original yeah, you know what? I, details. Excuse me, I'm going to have to interrupt you because the hearing this evening deals strictly with the historic status of this home. Okay. And, and so we cannot speak about what may or may not happen in the future. That we will address under another case. Okay. But I do appreciate all the history that you've given, the interesting history that you've given us. Um, I. I, I'm sure as all the rest of the board, I love our old historic buildings here in Santa Fe. And of course we wanna uh, help to preserve them, correct? So if uh, anything else, uh, three applicants that you wish to say at this time? So I would just say that we're, we're, if the front facade and the original portions were um, made to be uh, significant, we would be happy with that. That would all work with our idea. It's just we don't want the the newer additions that aren't really in keeping with the original style to be made his significant. Okay, thank you for your comments. Anything else? If not, uh, at this time, I will ask for public comment. Let me see what we have here. Uh, we have Stephanie Beninato. Uh, yes, Stephanie. Hello. Um, do I need to get sworn in? I don't think I was yet sworn uh, in. No, you have not been sworn in. Would you please swear her in, Melissa? Yes. You swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank um, you. state your name and Oh, I'm sorry, Stephanie Beninato, PO Box 1601, Santa Fe 87504. Um, I think that a little bit more than the two little uh, bump outs have been added because that whole back courtyard has been filled in with a kitchen. I think it's a kitchen addition in 2008 to 11, somewhere in there. Um, and I, I wonder if they actually got a permit to do that because why wasn't the status looked at at that point? Um, it's kind of surprising to me that um, these additions that occurred 1985, post 85, that none of those brought up the status of the building. Um, I am a little concerned about this process because it seems that it, it is either significant or it's not. It, it, the, the whole idea of leaving out certain uh, uh, facades or parts of facades seems to me to go against the whole idea of what a significant building really is. At the same time, there is a lot of history associated with this building. 
um, and you know, not only just Kate Chapman, but uh, other people um, who have association there. I actually feel better now, though, even though the owner wasn't supposed to talk about it, but I feel better that the owner wants to reinstate the openings on that on that <clears throat> facade one, because to me, making that a significant building without the original openings actually you can't see them, you know, you can see where they were, to me, just would be totally contradictory. So I'm still kind of on the fence. I kind of feel like this is a very um, bootlegged process. And I really wonder if there's any other significant building in town that has gone through this process where parts of it actually were covered. I mean, they are 6A and whatever. Um, those are covering a part of this building. And w are, are there other significant buildings where you go, oh, there's like six facades we're not going to designate or, or not part of this significant structure? So again, I mean, maybe you should say this is 339 and we're making 339 significant, but we're not making 341 significant. That's actually feel, time. Okay, I just feel that that would be uh, maybe a better, cleaner solution. Thank you. Um, Selma? <laughs> Uh, thank yeah. you. Were you going to say something or were you just giving us a I was, I was just trying to call time while muted. Okay. <laughs> I do have a comment, Madam Chair, if I could, in, in, in reference to the code, because this is, this is a little bit of a tricky issue because of the way the code is written, <laughs> as, as we often come to in these hearings. Um, my reading of the code is that, that for significant buildings, there's a requirement to retain historic materials, historic architectural features and details. There's not a requirement to retain the ones that are not historic. So there, there are built-in protections for the historic aspects of the home. That's my reading. Yeah, I, and I can understand why people are saying, okay, this is, we have, it's really two buildings that are connected and it appears that part of the, uh, some of the uh, portions are non-historic. And I was trying to think of if there was any other building that is significant here in Santa Fe that we have said, oh yes, but a lot of its portions are non-historic. I, and I can't think of anything right, at, right offhand. But if we read, and if I could do this very quickly, and I know John Eddy is waiting, and well, this is the first case, but uh, just to reiterate what significant structure is, it's a structure located in a historic district that is approximately 50 years or older, and that embodies distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction. For a structure to be designated as significant, it must retain a high level of historic integrity. A structure may be designated as significant, A, for its association with events or persons that are important on a local, regional, national, or global level, or if it is listed on or is eligible to be listed on the State Register of Cultural Properties or the National Register of Historic Places. So that's- I'm sorry, I, I, I can think of an example if that would be helpful. Say what? I can think of an example if that would be helpful. And yes, it's that would be very helpful, please. If, uh, if the board would, would refer to 831 El Caminito, that's a significant structure, very important to Santa Fe's history, one of the most important residences in Santa uh, Fe. The La Pena House? Substantial, substantial non-historic addition to the rear of the house. Okay. Okay, well, she thought of one. Okay, I'm going to go back to public comment and we have John Eddy. Mr. Eddy, you have the floor. Um, I, John? Can you hear me now? You? Yes, John. Um, sure. okay. Swear you in, please? Yes, please, go Mr. ahead. Mr. Eddy, you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Thank you, please state your name and address for the record. My name is John Eddy. My address is 227 East Palace Avenue, Suite D, Santa Fe. It's on Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, board members, this is a really interesting case because of the fact that you have an applicant who is passionate 
about maintaining or upgrading the significance of a property, which is to be applauded, I think. Um, so having said that, just to cut to the chase, I believe that the pink portion, the original footprint of the property is undeniably significant due to all the reasons that have already been discussed. I believe that the duplex to simplify things is uh, to be excluded from that significant uh, statusing of this property. Uh, I do believe that the spirit of the owner will see that this property receives the appropriate attention that is deserved all these years. And this is pure conjecture on my part, but I have a sense that that's where these folks are going with this property. So I'm very, very encouraged that they are so enthusiastic about the legacy of Kate Chapman and seeing that it is preserved in this first of her buildings on Plaza Valentin. That's all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John. And I also uh, applaud the applicants because that's, that's the same sense that I got in reading the packet. Uh, so if no one else has anything further to say, I, wait, Member Beachside, we hadn't Thank heard you. from you. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I think I recall a, another example, which is on Comuna de las Animas, the, the BJO Nordfeldt house, which we designated pretty recently as significant. And I believe there was an addition on the rear similar to this house for maybe a laundry room or something like that, that we excluded, um, but designated the house as significant. That's correct, Madam Chair. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad that your memories are way better than the Chair's memories. Mm -hmm. But uh, with that being said, I will entertain a motion at this time. Uh, Member Guida. Okay. Um, so in case 2020-001-784, HDRB 339 and 341 Plaza Valentin, uh, I move uh, that we proceed with staff's recommendation and uh, status uh, the structure as uh, significant with the exception of the four additions that are noted on page 19, um, which are non-historic. Thank you. Uh, Member Beachside. A second. Uh, is there further discussion? Oh, may I add one thing to my motion? Mr. Guido, yes. I will also exclude the fence. Okay. Thank you. We're clear on the motion, everybody. Um, all those in favor of this motion, uh, we'll have a roll call vote. Melissa. Yes. Me Member Beachside. Yes. Member Venue. Yes. Member Guida. Yes. Vice Chair Kelly. Yes. Member Larson. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you very much. Sorry. And, can uh, I just just yes. uh, uh, interjection? So there were um, five additions listed one of which was the coyote fence. So you're talking about three additions plus a coyote fence, correct? I articulated four additions plus the coyote fence. Yeah. So that would be your but five. There, there are only four additions in total. There are one, correct. two, three. three. That's Include, the fence. That's right. Three additions uh, plus the coyote fence. There is a, there is a, there's a small bathtub addition. That's oh yeah, the, this guy. The there we go. That's okay, so there are the four additions uh, correct on page 19 and plus the uh, coyote fence, correct? correct. So, of the motion. Excuse me, remember Guida, so the possibly historic um, addition, the closet addition in the corner you would like to also exclude? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. I am wondering if the applicants for uh, case, the case at 104 Lorenzo Road are here now. Yes, Madam Chair. They are here? 
Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, uh, is there a motion to uh, take this off of the uh, uh, table? Uh, so moved. Yes, Member Beachside. So moved. Uh, is there a second? I believe Frank. Second. Okay, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Um, uh, roll call vote, please, to take this off the table, please. Melissa? Yes. Uh, yes. Member Beachside? Yes. Hello? Member Brendan Yu? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson? Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you, Melissa. Um, this is Angela's case. Angela, may we hear your report, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Uh, we do not see you, but we can hear you. I think Lisa will make that possible. But I can speak in the meantime. I have been asked to. <laughs> Do oh, it. okay. Let's see. Start my video. There you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. In this case, number 2020-2174, correction is that the, the historic status is non-contributing per the memo. And then this is a 104 Lorenzo. This is a non-contributing residence in the downtown and east side historic district. The Pueblo Spanish Revival style house fronts Lorenzo Road with the house entrance visible from the street and a portion behind a coyote fence. The lot slopes from east to west down to Lorenzo Road. A guest house was added in 1991, which was case H9131. The owners wish to construct a 144 square feet freestanding greenhouse behind and to the east of the main house where there currently sits an outdoor garden. If you could go back to the picture, the first one, I believe. So that's the site that we're looking, either one. Yes, that's the site. There's, you can see that there's a garden there. That's the site of the proposed greenhouse. <clears throat> the site is, is surrounded, by, excuse me, the um, proposed height is nine feet. There um, are detailed elevations of the, of the greenhouse in your packet. Yeah, there. The site is surrounded by high walls, trees, vegetation, and structures, and is not publicly visible, nor would the proposed greenhouse be publicly visible. In your packet is a cross section, which is what you're looking at through the property that shows the existing relative vertical and horizontal relationships of the proposed greenhouse location. So you can tell the, 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 what's filled in there is the proposed greenhouse. And you can see how the house slopes up towards the east. Yeah. The, green, the greenhouse will be constructed of wood and rigid polycarbonate sheets. Information about the par polycarbonate material is in your packet. The material will be used primarily on the roof and lower three feet of the walls. It will be used in conjunction with two divided light barn wood sash windows and two divided light 30 inch wood doors. According to the owners, polycarbonate plastic roofing and partial walls performs well for growing plants, providing insulation and is shatterproof. Staff recommends approval of the proposed project and finds that the application complies with section 14-5.2 D general design standards for all historic district and 14-5.2 E for the downtown and east side design standards. And I stand for questions. Thank you for your record, Angela. I do have a question for Sally. And that is, Sally, would you read the portion of the code that covers greenhouses in this area, in this district? Thank you, Chair Rios, uh, members of the board. There is actually no specific provision for the downtown and east side historic district about greenhouse design. So uh, Sally, when this happens, when there isn't a provision, because I know there's provisions in other districts regarding greenhouses, uh, since there isn't one in the downtown east side, um, does that mean you can't build or you can? 
Um, we default to the design standards that apply to uh, buildings. And so we look to the recent Santa Fe style guidelines to see if it's um, consistent to the extent possible. I mean, when you have a structure that's not really a residence or a, a normal building, it's a little bit tricky to uh, apply 100% all of the standards kind of real strictly, but we generally apply the recent Santa Fe style guidelines to the structures in the downtown and Eastside Historic District. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Katz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I puzzled about this, but obviously this has no hint of either recent or old Santa Fe style but it's not publicly visible. So that's all irrelevant and it's just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other board members have questions for Angela or anyone else? Uh, Member Beachside. I have just a question about the visibility. Um, I understand it's not publicly visible, but um, are neighbors able to see the structure or maybe this is a question for the applicant. I can answer that first and then they can they, they can join in but um i i can tell you that it is not visible from when you're up on that site other neighbors around it i think it's really important to note though that it's not relevant whether or not neighbors can see it oh right public visibility is public visibility and um, i'm just maybe we could talk about the the other proposal for a greenhouse that was already built on Apodaca Hill in the same district that that I believe we denied because neighbors um, had a concern about that design. Exactly. Also not publicly visible. Yeah, that's why it was brought before the board, and the only thing that you could see from the neighbor from uh, from a public right of way, you could not see the house but from the neighbor who brought this before the city, because I believe the applicant built it without a permit uh, and then the board denied it, you can only see two feet of this greenhouse. So, I believe um, the, the I, rationale in that case, Madam Chair, if, if I recall, and I was, just, I was just starting back at the city when that case was, was being appealed, I believe that the, that the discussion had to do with, with its harmony um, and its relative relationship with with recent Santa Fe style and it being a geodesic dome shape that doesn't that, that the board didn't feel jived with Santa Fe style that that's my recollection but again I was not I was not staffing the board when the case was originally heard yeah well we're, we better focus on this case but yes that's I think that was the discussion that was taking place um, let me see, uh, since I don't see any more hands up, I will um, have the applicants come forward and get sworn in. Applicant or applicants? Donde están? Where are they? Uh, I do see Irene, I think she may be muted. Okay. Um, Would you just give them a moment to um, figure out the unmute? There we go. Looks good. Okay, let me see. Oh, there they are. And if Melissa could swear you in, please. Okay. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? We do. Thank you. When you speak, please state your name and address for the record. Yes, Lance good evening. Olivieri. Lance Olivieri, 104 Lorenzo Road, Santa Fe, 87501. Irene Olivieri, 104 Lorenzo Road, 87501. Uh, thank you both. You heard staff's report. Did you have anything further to add? Uh, just to emphasize that it is it is not it would not be visible from any any of the neighbors. Or, or um, anywhere else. And, and we're really interested in sustainability and, and growing our own vegetables year round. Um, we're trying to use local materials. Uh, we try to use materials that would, would have been available in the past, except for the plastic, which of course is the really an advantage for us to grow things with. 
uh, because it reflects uh, UV light and filters the sunlight so that the plants don't um, burn and get too hot. And the reason we're not using glass is because there are a lot of trees in the area and a lot of potential for branches to fall or trees to fall. And so we thought it would be better to use polycarbonate. Thank you very and much. We did, we did look uh, for anything in Santa Fe or anything in New Mexico that resembled an old greenhouse. And the only things we found were some old Victorian ones. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me see if any board members have questions for you. Uh, board members, any questions for the applicants? It appears at this time they do not. I do not see any uh, hands that are raised. And let me see. Madam Chair. Pardon? Madam Chair, may I make a, a quick comment? Absolutely, you may. Reference to the, the Olivieri statement, looking, looking for examples. I would like to point out that, that John Gamim himself created a number of, of sunroom type architectural shapes that, that had quite a lot of characteristics of, of a greenhouse like this. You can see them all over town. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Larson. Um, I'd just like to comment that this is a really lovely design. Um, I can see what he's done with incorporating the rock work um, that you can see in, in that in that elevation photo that was presented earlier. Um, I, I think that this is a you know it's it's a really sensitive design and um, I think it is in line with the Santa Fe style. I think there are elements there um, that are very clear, such as the corbels and again that that masonry rock rock work. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Member Bichai. I just um, wanted to say, echo what, what Flynn said. This is um, a design that's harmonious with the Santa Fe style requirements. And I just wanted to correct myself on the previous example I raised that I think it was due to the geodesic dome design that we had uh, denied the previous application, not because of the visibility. Thank you. Member Guida. Just a quick note to say that I really appreciate the quality of these drawings. I think it's a really smart design. It's just very well represented. Re well represented. Um, uh, I also, you know, I'm personally not concerned about the polycarbonate. I think it's a it's a sensible and sensitive material. Um, I'm thinking of the greenhouses that are down at Los Poblanos Ranch, you know, the historic greenhouses that are that are glazed or quote unquote glazed in in, uh, in polycarbonate. Looks great. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, I will ask for public comment at this time. Uh, Stephanie Beninato. Okay, she's muted. I'm gonna go to John Eddy. John? Now yes, he's- Can muted. you hear me? Okay, John, go ahead. You yes. have the floor. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Rios. I think it's really unfortunate that this greenhouse will not be visible to the public. <laughs> the well, that's that that I comment. Uh, the complimentary comments that have already been made, I want to echo them very strongly. This design is, is beautiful and sensitive to the spot where you're putting this greenhouse. The elements that you've brought into it, such as the divided light and the rock work, really work for me and the uh, native materials such as the corbels and the beams totally fit here. So I heartily encourage the, uh, the board to embrace this and, and uh, approve the, the uh, request and I thank the applicants. And again, I wanted to uh, reiterate board member Guida's statement that these are really beautiful drawings. Your team. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Ms. Um, Ms. Beninato. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to echo what most people have said. Um, I think the only thing that bothers me is when people say it's not going to, I mean, this is obviously not publicly visible. It's on the back side of the house. But when people go, there's lots of vegetation and there's walls. I always want to say, yes, but vegetation can die and walls can go away. 
Um, so I, I, I don't know that that's a, a reason to say it's not publicly visible. And again, in this case, I, I don't think that quite matters. Um, and I used to live on um, Cerro Gordo right there by Lorenzo. My access was on Lorenzo. And I don't believe that even from Cerro Gordo that you would be able to see this property. I, I might be wrong about that, but I, I don't think so. And I do think the design is um, uh, harmonious with, this, with Santa Fe style, even though it obviously doesn't have the mass dominated walls, um, even a little bit. Um, and, you know, maybe if some of those, the two, one of the two side windows on e either side were mass, it would probably be a little more harmonious, but I, I think it's a really nice design and, uh, uh, and I think we should encourage greenhouses wherever they can fit in and, and be compatible. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, board members, appears no one else has any comments or questions. Uh, I will entertain a motion, please. Member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. In case number 2020-21698. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Got the wrong one. All the way back to 104 Lorenzo Road, 2020-2174, moved to um, approve the application as submitted. Uh, a second, please. Second. Uh, thank you. Roll call vote. Uh, Madam Chair, who, who seconded the motion? Member uh, Beachside. Member Beachside, if, when you make a motion, please indicate your name right before you make the motion. Just say your last name quickly so that uh, it's clear for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenue. Yes. Member Gita. Yes. Vice Chair Katz. Yes. Member Larson. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you very much. And applicants, good luck with your garden. Well, thank you thank very you much. Thank you so we much. really appreciate it. Lance did the drawings and the design. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next case is 2020-002170, located at 1210 Canyon Road. This is in reference to a historic status, and this is Daniel's case. Daniel, may, may we hear your report, please? Madam Chair, before the report begins, may I ask if, any, uh, if anyone wishes to be moved to the panel as an applicant on this case? Please raise your hand. Okay, Madam Chair, I believe that we are good to go with the applicants. Thank you. Daniel, your report, please. Okay. Yeah, I'm just another note um, on the report. Um, I've prepared a slideshow and also a short film to try and um, give you a sense of this property. Um, the report is <laughs> not extremely detailed, and I'm hoping that... Um, the film will get a, bit, a sense and I can interject occasionally to give you a sense of, of, of the character of this property. So I'll start with the report. So 1210 uh, Canyon Road is a sim single family residential property with non-contributing status to the downtown and east side historic district. It is a complex property revealing several sequences of construction leading to its present appearance. It is likely constructed in the early 20th century as an offshoot of the Lucero home set higher on the hillside. If you could just go through the slides to the next, the first three, four, five slides. Next one. So this is the, the upper portion, the southern portion, which is be believed to be the um, original part, the original structure or the earliest structure. According to several aerial photographs, Several structures on the property were in place by the 1940s. Next slide. This is the whole property. So the house, the, the lowest point, that corner is where the photo you just saw. And then there's a garage, carport, and um, very steep terrain. 
these included the garage, the so-called garage or small rectangular building at the bottom of the hill located in the north end of the property that's up on the screen and a compact dwelling now encased in the current house. The current, uh, the property took its present form consisting of the accretionary house, carport, garage, and most of the connecting perimeter walls in the 1950s. Several areas of the house show advanced uh, deterioration. The house occupies a five-sided lot lining the edge of Upper Canyon Road that's on the, the, the upper left part of the picture near its intersection with Camino Cabra. The shape of the lot is dictated by its relation to Canyon Road, the north wall and the vehicular easement at the south. The next slide. So this is um, the, the vehicular easement with the house and the, and the driveway off, off the street. The house, its outbuildings and other structures respond to their hillside location. You can just scroll through the next one, next several. These are uh, mostly small volumes cut into the slope. Next. Next. This is the elevation that is uh, most visible from the road. Several areas are supported by stone retaining walls. That uh, hillside gives a promontory setting for the residents. Next. It's the same elevation again. Next. This is the side of the garage. Next. This is the, um, the wall on the, the east side, east elevation. Next. Next. So this is the view uh, from Upper Canyon Road, approaching uh, from Upper Canyon Road. The first structure encountered is a wall wrapping the west, north, and east sides of the property. The wall is not original and presumably was constructed in the 1950s with the north section added later. Tall in height, it gives a sense of fortification. A pair of antique looking doors penetrate the north wall near the northeast corner next. This is uh, from further up Canyon Road, next. This is a directly looking on the right side, you can see the, the garage doors, next. Yeah. Next, and those are the close-up of the garage doors. These uh, plank panel doors open to a small rectangular room dug partially into the hillside. Above the entry is a rustic wood lintel. To the east, a small three over one sash window is observed by a metal, obscured by a metal grill and beyond an assembled wood gate leading to the property. The garage is made of waist-high stone walls topped with adobes. Can you go a couple back, I think? to the, yeah, there you can see the waste, the wall, and then the adobe on top. The roof is a deck of random width boards over east-west line vigas. Its original north facade appears to have increased in height with a new parapet. Markings of a stove flue are evident in the southeast corner. Um, just to, so to give you a little more sense of the property, because I know that most of the uh, facades just uh, we saw through brief pictures. I'd like to show a film that I have put together. It takes one minute um, and we'll see. Hopefully this will now work. To just give a sense of what it's like to move through the property. Can you see my screen now? Oh, no. oh. Okay. So this is the entrance at the top. This is the small volumes cut into the upper part of the hill. A lot of non-historic windows, a lot of hodgepodge sort of changes to the, the structure. This is the wall from the inside that faces onto Upper Canyon Road. That's the garage. And this is the number, the, what I would consider to be the primary facade. 
That was a video. Do you want to see it again? <laughs> well, uh, John, uh, I mean, Daniel, sorry. I don't know why I keep calling you John. I, I rename people and I apologize. Daniel, <laughs> uh, can you show us the facades that you are indicating should be the primary facades? This one yeah. is the one. So, so the primary, I'll stop sharing the screen. I have um, recommended the, the, the primary facade be that wall that faces Canyon Road. Um, maybe we can go, Lisa, back to the presentation. Um, I believe the last part of this, the last uh, screen of the slideshow, if you continue in the slideshow, we should show that. Next. Yeah. So the, at the beginning, I showed the, the upper on the left, that photo, um, that's the upper part of the, uh, of, the, of the hill. That facade seems to me that it could be primary given that it behind those are actual rooms. It's an actual facade of the house and it's probably um, the original earliest structure. So I would designate that as primary and then the Facade number one, which is visible from the streets, which extends over two um, stories. There's some historic material, some non historic material on this facade, but um, given the character of the property, which is um, very hodgepodge, there's been a lot of informal changes, probably a lot of changes that were um, not permitted. Um, you know, often pieces of uh, plexiglass were just tacked into a wall opening. Um, these, these are the two facades that represent the property, in my view. Okay, and Daniel, on primary, on the facade number one, that you're suggesting be a primary facade, uh, can you point out what are the non-historic features? Well, the, the, the window, the upper window on the right, for sure. Um, possibly the door to the left of that. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how old that door is. The, the report that we have doesn't go um, you know, window by window, but um, this, is, this is a single facade that, um, that, is, that shows the character of the structure for, for what it is. But it does have these, certainly that window on the upper right is not historic. Thank you. Um, Member Benvenu, do you have a question for Daniel? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't read the staff recommendation, which was... Oh, I apologize, Daniel. Yeah, I for, forgot. Um, it re recommends that the uh, house, garage, carport, carport, and walls, one and wall two, be designated as contributing. So the structures and the walls be contributing. <clears throat> and the facades one and three be designated primary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for your report. Member Katz, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think Daniel just cleared it up um, by making, uh, suggesting that walls one and two also be uh, primary. Well, contributing, excuse me. Uh, primary. Well, if they're contributing, they're primary because they don't have a whole lot of facades on them. Okay. That's correct. Um, if it's a yard wall, it's essentially contributing and primary. <laughs> yeah. It can be both. Because, okay. you know, I, I, I sort of think that that south wall three is completely uninteresting and all of the uh, facades on the east side are all very interesting and contribute to the um, appearance of the house, but they're totally invisible. They're behind the wall. And given that the wall is, contrib would, is recommended to be contributing, the wall will be there. So we, you know, no one will ever really see those facades. So I think that the recommendation makes a lot of sense. And I thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you. And Daniel, I do want to thank you for your uh, report, including the, the, audio, the video. That was very interesting. It went really fast, but I know we're... Yeah, uh, I can show it again if you want. I, no, I didn't want no, to waste too much of your time. No, that's okay. Uh, Member Beachside. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Daniel, for the thorough presentation and the, the photos are very helpful. Are you recommending primary facades on the garage and the carport? 
Or are those covered by wall one and wall two? Yeah, well, I'm recommending the, essentially wall one, if it's a contributing and it's also primary, that garage, it's, uh, I didn't recommend it. Uh, you can certainly consider that it's uh, uh, historic, but totally not visible. From, from the public street. Okay. Sorry, is, are the garage doors on wall one? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, board members, at this time? Appears not. Applicant or applicants, would you come forward and get sworn in? Hi. And um, I believe my client hasn't is is trying to get was trying to get on. Um, it's the L O. Is the um, is her name on it? Okay. She's here. She's muted. There she is. Okay. Unmuted. Hello. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go. Can you swear both of you in, please? Do you okay. swear under the penalty? Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies you're about to give are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And when you speak, please state your name and address for the record. Sure. Um, my name is Sandra Donner, um, 1611 Paseo de Peralta, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87501. Um, and um, this is, I think this is definitely one of those projects where it's very unfortunate that we're not having um, field trips. Um, it's a very complex project. Um, it has gone through um, multiple um, multiple renovations. Uh, one of the contractors who came to look at the house called it um, weekend projects um, <laughs> because they were obviously never permitted. Um, and that's that's one of the issues. Um, I actually, I, I completely agree with, with Daniel's, uh, Daniel's recommendation for wall number three. Um, although it is a relatively, I believe uh, member Katz called it a boring facade. Um, it's, there's actually something kind of nice about it. Um, um, although I'm not sure it's actually publicly visible because I believe it's a private lane. Um, however, those are the two, um, those are the two original rooms on the upper level of the building. Um, there, it was probably a four square, I mean, and I say that really loosely because it's definitely not a square, um, but it was probably a four room structure above the stone building, which was more than likely the original structure um, before anything else was, was constructed. Um, the, one, the one issue with, um, with elevation number one, and, and one thing I wanted to clarify, um, because I believe that there was a comment about wall one being the same as elevation one, and, and that I believe is incorrect. No, that's not correct. No. But right, so, so elevation one is the actual elevation of the house, where wall one is the elevation of Long Canyon Road and Apodaca Hill. Is that correct, Daniel? Yes, that's correct. Claire, so you were saying one and three. Um, so, so I actually, I believe that, um, and do you actually have the elevations that I drew um, in this packet? They are in the packet that the board members have. But not um, on your I didn't put them in the slideshow. Okay, um, yeah, and the, the only reason that I, I bring that up, and I, I know when I looked at the, at the packet, they, um, they, for some reason, they weren't super visible, but when you're looking at the, um, at the north elevation, you can see um, elevation one, which Daniel was talking about being primary, um, and that it's it's partially visible. Um, and really, what's what's visible from the road, and you can see it from the photographs as well, is actually the second floor, which has been um, yeah. So you can see in this photograph, like you can see the second floor, but you can't actually see the stone original building, um, which is unfortunate because the that whole um, that whole end of the building um, was kind of either retrofitted or built later on. Um, the windows are all um, single pane windows, and the actual structures that are um, that are coming off of the building. There's a balcony, and there's also I believe there's 
two, there's two portals. There's a portal over the door at the basement stone level. And there's also a portal over the shed. Um, those were probably added later and they're actually in pretty bad condition. In fact, the balcony is, we're having it reviewed by structural engineers right now, but the balcony is actually hazardous. Can I just, uh, one interjection <laughs> for the board members, page 55 uh, in the packet has elevations also with the numbers of corresponding to these plans. So I guess, I mean, my, my request would be that the, that if this is designated primary, that it's only the first floor, um, not the second floor, and that there's consideration for structural issues. Okay, so uh, I have a question for uh, Ms. Donner. And I do agree with her that in a case like this, I really wish we could have done the field trip. When you get into something that's a bit complicated, uh, it's really best for the board to walk, even though your, re your report, Daniel, was as thorough as thorough could be under the circumstances, but it's different when you can actually walk through the property. It, it gives you, uh, I believe it gives you a better sense of what the project is. But um, Ms. Donner, and maybe I should let the other person speak first and then I'll make my comments. Ms. Unger? Did you have something to say? Oliver. Oh, Oliver. Oliver? Oh, it has Kim Unger. Who is that? No, that's I another case. Know. Oh, that's somebody else. <laughs> uh, apologies, apologies. Ms. Oliver? Yeah. Uh, yeah, please state your name and your address. Um, I'm Lauren Oliver, 1210 Canyon Road, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87501. And did you wish to add something uh, further to what Ms. Donner just told us? Not so much. I'm I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the I I'm I can tell you sort of how I feel about things. Um, you know, the wall to me is the wall one is is really what people see, and for me the biggest problem there is there's an electric meter that I want to take off of there because it is um, you know it's historic and it's something that every Every tourist in town ends up walking past my house. So it's, it's in general, my aim to turn, to do this is to look at this as a restoration to sort of somewhere around the 20s, 30s. I'm, I'm trying to go for something very rustic, very historic, very original. So the things that I'm gonna be doing, a lot of it is, is really just make, first of all, making it safe, doing the repairs, um, but, really sort of feel like you're walking into a piece of history okay, when we really um, have to, excuse me for interrupting you we really sure. have to get to the what we are reviewing this evening what has been okay happened. sorry no That's what will happen that's yeah. fine uh we're looking at the historic is is this house uh potentially contributing what are the primary facades that's what we're looking at right now okay Great. So the, uh, the recommendation by recommendations by staff are that uh, facades one and three be primary. And in addition to those, the house, the garage, the carport and wall, uh, wall one and two. So if you wish to comment in reference to the um, to what uh, the staff person Daniel has given us, uh, you are welcome to do so. Um, yeah, no, these are, I mean, he's done a great report here and, and Sandra and I have talked a lot about this. So um, whatever it is, you know, that, that I totally agree with what Sandra's saying. I will just reiterate that um, that balcony we're looking at on the north elevation, the, that one elevation, that, that balcony is pretty unsafe. Uh, and the portal to the right over the door I'm, we're going to have to do something about that. Um, yeah, it's sagging. You can actually see. Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> and and that window um, doesn't look very historic to me. It should be like a French window, and it's also flat against the wall, and it should be put back. You know, um, recessed. Recessed. That's it. But that's you know. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about doing. So um, there you go. I don't, I don't want to take any more time. Okay, so uh, let me ask this question again. Uh, Sandra, do you feel that uh, 
what do you do you think this house should be made contributing yes or no and uh i yeah i mean honestly the the thing is is i the house itself is such i think um Daniel said it well, it was, it's a hodgepodge of things. Nothing, nothing was done with any kind of coordination um, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of illegal construction. Um, I, think that, I think that it could stay non-contributing. I, I don't think that any of the actual, like truly historic portions with the exception of the, um, of the South side um, along what's called Loretta Lane is really the only visible historic portion of this house. Um, unfortunately, I think that there's been a lot of missteps along the way um, that have caused this, what probably should have been a contributing house um, to be, you know, just just kind of a, a mess. Um, a horrible shambling wreck. <laughs> okay, Sorry. Lauren does it better than me, maybe. Um, but that's really, I mean, the intention of the, of the client is to, to bring it, to bring some cohesiveness to it. And um, I, I don't know that it really qualifies as contributing. I would feel that maybe only a portion of it would, um, but I've actually never seen, I mean, that was the question with the significant one before. It, it's difficult to, to call something partially contributing when a lot of it is non-contributing. Thank you. Chair Rios, could I make a look? Yes, Daniel. Um, one thing I wanted to um, give credit to John Murphy, who did the HCPI, and um, a lot of the report is um, stolen from him. So thank you to John. Um, and second, um, I'd to like to just defend the house um, as it is. Um, when you look at uh, houses all over this country, you know, you see a lot of houses that are built on flat terrain and or boxes. And um, one of the things that I think really contributes to the character of Santa Fe is the willingness of people to work with terrain. And, and this house really exemplifies that. The mishmash that it is, it is still um, a really, um, the word that comes to mind is kind of a heroic effort to work yes. with with the terrain that it's on. And for me, that is character defining. I'm not sure how that squares with the code, but um, that I think is what, I, um, you know, the owner says that everyone walks by this house. And I think that's a big part of the character of Santa Fe and of, and of this house. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Member Katz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think this is such a, fantastic example of vernacular structure that different folks, and I thought John Murphy did a brilliant job on his report describing how each part of it was built. Um, my question is on that north facade that we're looking at. Um, I gather from John Murphy's report that that was built in the late 40s or the 50s, that second story. And I don't know uh, which would make it historic. I don't know when the second floor portal or the first floor um, portal were built. Do we have any information on that? It's um, it's really it's it's unknown really when that was built. I don't disagree with you at all that the second floor probably was built in the fifties. Um, it's not the actual, it's not the actual facade or the structure of the second floor. It's really all the additives. It's the window. Um, it's obviously that large single pane window, um, which is in bad condition, including the lintel above it. Um, it's the, it's the door um, at the balcony. And it's really, it's the consideration that the, that the balcony and the portal are both in very poor structural condition. This house was very neglected. Um, so, so that's more the considerations rather more than anything. Um, I think that if those things could be taken, um, could be kind of taken off the plate in terms of being a primary facade, um, the first floor, certainly the, the entry door, the, the windows, the stone walls, the vegas poking out from the stone, those are certainly, um, certainly elements of a primary facade, but um, I would just, I would like to have exclusions on this facade so that they, so they could be done. Um, like Daniel was saying about that that one single pane window. 
it, it, well, that single pane window, I think could probably be dated and I doubt that it's from the 50s, although it possibly could be. Um, and yeah. I really do think that the, uh, the structure of the upstairs portal, yeah. bottom, lower floor portal, um, yeah, they may need to be repaired. They may need to be replaced in kind, but I think that they're very character defining of that facade. And I would oppose excluding them for that reason. Um, I don't know whether anyone has any information about the date of the. Uh, the, the only thing that the only thing that we were able to find out, or I should say that John was able to find out or that he believed was true, that was that a lot of the elements that were added to the house, um, possibly the portals and the balcony and as well as the garage doors on Canyon Road were quite possibly added later as like older elements that were brought in and installed to make this make it look a little older. Um, so they may be historic pieces, but from another time, not or from another place. Maybe that's a better way to put it. So unfortunately, there's not a lot. No, we don't know a lot. Excuse me for a minute. My dog's barking. <laughs> and Chuck, can I just offer, offer a thought about the the elements of a, of, a, of a primary facade that are deteriorated beyond repair. Yes, and that please. is that our code does make accommodations for that in, in, in requiring replacement in kind, but not, not precluding their replacement. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Frank, did you have something further? No, I'm done, thanks. Thank you. Uh, other board members, do you have comments or questions at this time? It appears that no one has comments or questions right at this time. So I will ask for members from the public. We have Kim Unger, who is a member from the public and wishes to comment. Ms. Unger, uh, would you get sworn in? Yes, sir. Or maybe not. Kim is um, an applicant on another case. Oh, OK. She's got her hand up. So and now she just muted herself. Sorry, I have to go by what I'm seeing. Um, John Eddy, you have been sworn in and you have the floor. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. This house uh, contributes immensely to the streetscape and always has, despite the changes over time. And as has been stated, it, it is a really beautiful, <laughs> uh, an example of vernacular building in Santa Fe and people making do with what they had within the landscape. So it's very important to my way of thinking. I wanted to ask a question of staff for my own clarification and understanding. I believe there was a mention that the wall of the north facade had been extended in height at a certain time? Well, yes, I believe that the, the original structure was the stone structure. And then it was the second story came later. No, no, I'm not speaking of the house. I'm speaking of the, the facade on the street where the garage doors are. The wall, yes. wall number one. Yeah, no. um, the, yeah. John Murphy said, writes that it's, um, the pos I'm not sure exactly what he said. The, the, yeah, possibly it was it was heightened. It was increased yes. in height. Yes. Yeah. Um, Chairwoman Reels perhaps has a memory of this as, as well, but I do have a distant memory of that wall going up at a certain point during my we, lifetime. I can. Uh, the, I had a discussion with Mr. Murphy. One of the things he said was that um, in earlier times, this board used to make. Um, requests or conditions that walls have openings um, and that and that, that that suggested to John Murphy that this wall was something that was approved by the board with the condition that that opening that you see right in the middle of the picture be included in the wall. I understand. Chairwoman Reels, do you have a recollection of this wall changing uh, in your lifetime? I can barely remember what how this meeting started this evening. Um, <laughs> That is time. Um, and I just want to note, John, if, if you want to ask your questions all in a block and then allow staff to respond, that'll make sure you get your full two minutes because I was kind of rolling during your uh, discourse with Daniel. So I'll leave it to the chair, but. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, John, I do not recall 
this wall. Uh, I don't recall the, the history of this wall, so sorry. sorry. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Oh. I do. Uh, uh, I would like to see this house uh, maintained or brought into contributing because of its contribution to the streetscape. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Beninato. Hello, I'm Stephanie Beninato. I believe that this house should be made contributing um, in the other structures as well, especially the garage since, if I'm not correct, but it seems that the garage and wall one are the same, that they are attached in some way. Um, and if the facade, the other facade that we're talking about, uh, the one with the thick wall, is that the south facade, south elevation, excuse me, or the west elevation? So you have photo. South, number three is south. Okay, okay. Because you're on, on what I can see on the online, I don't have this um, drawing of the facades. I just have photographs. So I think that is characteristic of the house. I think the house um, yes, as you go right there at that corner, it definitely um, is an important part of the streetscape. And as pointed out by member Katz uh, and staff or repetitively that um, you can um, maintain uh, and repair elements on a primary facade. So um, again, that shouldn't be a deterrent to, to um, declare it a primary facade. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board members, any other questions or comments? If not, I will entertain a motion, please. Uh, Member Benvenu. Hey, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll make a motion. There's no further discussion. In case number 2020-2170, uh, 1210 Canyon Road, I would move that the house, garage, carport, and walls one and walls wall two be designated as contributing and facades one and three be designated as primary, consistent with staff's recommendations and the record. Thank you. Um, is there a second to this motion? Would second. Member Katz seconded. Any further discussion? None being, uh, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Member Beachside. Yes. Member Bienvenu. Yes. Member Guida? Yes. Member Katz? Yes. Member Larson? Yes. The motion has been approved. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, applicants. Thank you and very much. Ask one quick question. Uh, yeah, go right ahead. Um, it, it, is that excluding the non historic window? On uh, I don't believe that was indicated. That was not indicated in the uh, in the motion. And we don't know whether it's non-historic. So it it was it's included. It's excluded. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next next case is twenty twenty zero zero two one seven one, located at eleven located at eleven sixty nine East Alameda Street. This is a non-contributing building, and this is Daniel's case. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Rios. 1169 East Alameda Street is a 2,200 square foot single family residential structure in the downtown and Eastside Historic District. It was built in 1983 and thus has a historic status of non-contributing. It is at the end of a private drive and has no public visibility from Canyon Road. It is uh, built in a Spanish Pueblo revival style over two stories and on a lot that descends away from the entrance from the north, north and south with a flat roof, earth toned stucco and large pane windows in the rear. The height of the existing structure is 23 feet. The applicant now proposes the following changes. Item one, demolition of a portion of the lower level sunroom on the south west corner, that's the sunroom. Uh, item two, construction of addition, approximately 100 square feet on the south facade. Its parapet will be one foot um, lower. Sorry, there's a word missing in my report. Uh, its, its parapet will be one foot lower than the demolished parapet it is replacing. It will have uh, flat metal shed roof canopies over the south facade for shading 
with a weathered appearance and is supported by steel frame. Item three, construction of a new 869 square foot addition attached to the west facade of only one story or 12 feet in height. This will include a portal on the north facade directly over the front door and continuing over the western portion of that facade as an open trellis. Wood elements to be stained with cabot semi-transparent driftwood gray stain. On the west facade will be two canales, a small glass block window in the shower room and two further windows without divided lights. On the south facade will be sliding glass doors and two further windows. All windows will be Anderson clad white window, windows in white. Item four, construct a 768 square foot new garage at the north end of the structure. This will have two nine by nine foot painted steel garage doors in a weathered gray color with small windows in the upper portion of the doors. Item five, restucco the entire structure in El Rey premium cream with fine sand, a fine sand texture. Item six, re-roof with TPO painted in a similar color to the stucco, which will not be visible. Uh, item seven, all windows will be Anderson white uh, clad and those visible from the private drive, even though they're uh, not publicly visible, will have uh, wood lintels and div uh, divided light panes. Staff recommendation, staff recommends approval of the proposed project and finds that the application complies with section 14-5.2 and D and E. Thanks, I stand for questions. Uh, Daniel, please describe the public visibility of this project. There is none. Zero. Not that I know of, no. Okay. Is this one where you enter by the intersection of Alameda and Gonzalez? Into Gonzalez? And as you ask the owner, I'm not sure exactly. Okay. Well, you, you make a kind of a turn and go up a hill. Right, yeah. It's up to, up at the end. And it's at the very end of we're, we're at the very end of East Alameda. It's a dead end private drive. Okay, you're gonna to have to get sworn in. Hold on. Yeah, Adam Chair, do you see on the on the screen the- Yes, the yeah, I do. Image? Okay. Okay, the other question I have is, did I hear the report say that the applicant is proposing a cream color? That's like an uh, off-white. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes, it's a- that was the color. It's a color that I believe has been um, has been approved by this board before. It has for an entire building, not under a portal, but for an entire building. I I recall that um, I spoke with other members of staff, and that that had been the case. Okay, because I'm going to read to you from fourteen dash five point two e b. All exterior walls of a building are painted alike. The colors range from a light earth color to a dark earth color. And do you feel that I, whenever I think of an earth color, I think of in the Brown family. These are just my comments. I don't know if other, how other board members feel, but um, that's uh, most homes do have light colors, but maybe under a portal but not uh, the entire home. And this house looks like it's quite a sizable, quite a large house. But let's see what the, um, what the design I can is. show you, a, I can try and show you with the camera. This is, can you see, um, I can't find my camera, but can you see the cream stucco picture there? You need to pop it inside the, the, the virtual background. I'm trying to, oh, just a second. Let me just, just technical manipulating here. Turn off my, I'm going to turn off my virtual background for a second. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's not really like a whitish. No. Uh, calling that coffee, a cream. Coffee cream. <laughs> it looks like it's more like it's earth tone cream. I don't know. Brownish, pinkish. Okay. Um, I had I had the same 
question and I spoke in my, I, I believe I remember speaking with Lisa Roach who said that this color had been approved before. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Board member, any other board members have questions at this time for John? For Daniel, 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 Daniel. <laughs> All biblical. Okay. okay, it looks like uh, Member Guida. Yeah, so um, Daniel, to me, this does not look like a Spanish Pueblo revival house. This, this I know, is, a, is an architect designed house by Rex Roberts, uh, who's a passive solar architect um, mm -hmm. in the 60s and 80s. Um, I originally, in my report, I called it a recent Santa Fe style. Okay. All right, I, I, I was, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the uh, architects' names in, okay. in the city, but. It's, it's obviously an important residence um, from, from what we're seeing in the original design, but let's hear from the applicants. Okay, let's see, no other questions? Uh, Melissa, would you swear in the applicants, please? Uh, Member Larson has a question for staff, looks like. Sorry, I just had one comment. Um, yeah, just going off of what Anthony just said. Um, yeah, you can actually just call it um, solar architecture. It's a very short period um, through the 1970s. So um, that would be the designated style, I would say. And what is it? Would you repeat that, Lar uh, Flynn? Um, it's just called solar architecture. It's just a short-lived okay. movement of the 70s. Okay, thank you. If you can swear in the applicants, please. Melissa. Uh, yes. Um, do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimonies you're about to give are the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you. When you speak, please state your full name and address for the record. My name is Lyra Parker, address is 1169 East Alameda Street. Nathan Martin, 1169 East Alameda. Okay, thank you both. Uh, either one of you, do you wish to add uh, further to staff's report? Um, I don't, but it sounds like there's gonna be some questions coming. Okay, and uh, Ms. Parker, did you need to want to add anything? No, just to clarify that uh, we did match the cream color to a home in our vicinity uh, to their stucco. So yeah, it's not, it's not, it won't be white. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see what questions the board members have. Board, board members, any questions at this time for the applicants? It actually looks like no one has any questions right now. Let me see. Uh, I will call for members from the public. And surprise, it's Stephanie Beninato. Hi, Stephanie. Stephanie, you have your hand up. And now I'm on. Uh, now I'm unmuted. It takes a couple of seconds for that unmute to come up on my screen. Um, I think that you're just going to approve this perhaps after some discussion. It is a non-contributing building. <clears throat> I'm glad that some of the board members are being very clear that this is not Santa Fe style in any way, shape or form. It is definitely a passive solar design um, with very big windows that began going out of style in the 80s when people realized they were overheating, especially when they weren't doing any kind of overhang on the south side. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, board members, if you do not have any questions or comments, I will entertain a motion. It appears that member Guida has a so, question or ready to make a motion. Just some comments here. I, I, I about the passive solar uh, designation. Um, and this is what the full understanding of this house is not publicly visible. Um, and is not contributing. Uh, but we recently had, um, and this board has recognized um, uh, a postmodern house from the 1980s is an important part of, of Santa Fe's history in a, in a east side district. Um, the passive solar design that we see here, and this is a, a, a really excellent example of, uh, of, of that period, um, 
from a significant architect nationally um, and an important part of Santa Fe's history. Um, what I personally object to on the design front is, is that that's kind of being, un, well, a kind of, it's, it's being undone by the proposed remodel, uh, both in terms of the massing of the addition of the removal of the sunroom, uh, the proposed color, um, and a great deal of the detailing here. So there is a, for me, there's a sense of loss um, with this project and a lack of recognition of its value uh, where the board has recognized other projects from this era that do sit outside of that 50 year mark um, as being important. Um, we have other examples of this at the Lavareta compound from Ed Masria's work and other, and Wayne Nichols, um, other local architects who were involved in the passive solar movement. I know these cases have come up before and we've discussed this um, and previous boards have as well. So I'm just, you know, raising the flag on, on that issue. Thank you for your comments, Amber Wiga. Can, can I uh, add to that? Yes, please, absolutely. Um, we are leaving the top windows, which are by far the majority of that style, which like will the stay. The big Claire story. The big Claire story. So we're only taking out that small section. So the majority of his architecture will stay in the building. It's just the one sunroom, which unfortunately just bakes in the- It's not heated, it's not cooled, it's, it's really inefficient. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Member Katz. Yes, um, I would be ready to make a motion unless other people want to do more commentary first. Okay, it appears that Member Larson has something. Member Larson. Hi, yes. Um, Thank you, and sorry, Frank, but um, I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, since, yeah, what Anthony said, this is such a, it's a, like I said earlier, it's a short period of, of architecture and it was very experimental, right? So it, it didn't always work the way that it was intended. And I think that you guys have expressed that in your concern of um, the efficiency of the sunroom. Um, I am not sure that completely removing it is the most ideal option. Um, I think we may need to look a little further into things, but I do understand your, your, your all, like your guys' concern and that there needs to be something done in terms of the design to make this work. But with what Anthony said, I think since that is such a prominent feature, um, how can we explore this to better preserve that architectural character. Thanks. Thank you. Can I, can I add another comment? Uh, yes, absolutely. If you look at the new proposed drawing, it the glass got smaller, but it's still very similar. See how there's the four panes of large glass there? Mm -hmm. It ultimately hasn't changed all that much. The upper clear story. And then the upper clear story is becoming more visible. Yes. Okay. Anyway, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Member Guida, did you have something further? Yes. Um, just to clarify some of, and, and to respond maybe to the applicant, I, you know, I, I have a, a great deal of understanding for, you know, homes not working and needing improvements. I mean, we, we see this all the time. Um, the homes from this period are not the only ones, right? Um, Old Adobe homes also don't work and are also drafty and also are difficult to, um, uh, to heat and cool and all that. Um, what we often look for in most other cases is, is designs that are harmonious with the fabric of the community and are harmonious with the architecture. I'm, I'm pointing out that, that there could be a more sensitive and sympathetic architectural solution here with this addition that I think is a, is a missed opportunity. Um, the, the work here may, and, the, and this board may indeed find that because this is a non-contributing structure, it's not publicly visible, that that's, that that's okay, or that doesn't matter if it simply meets uh, the letter of our ordinance. But beyond that, there is, we have an obligation to, to be a design review board as well. 
um, and uh, design harmony, uh, design that is sympathetic to something valuable um, architecturally is important. Um, and that's, that's really the point that I'm, that I'm making here. I appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you, Anthony. I think uh, one of the main things that the applicant pointed out was uh, that that wasn't working for them in terms of bringing in, it was way too hot. Is that what I understood you to say? Correct, yes. Yeah, and sometimes, unfortunately, even though uh, maybe a, a certain architectural style uh, was prominent at one time and created by a particular architect, uh, if that is not working in today's day and age, then you need to, uh, in my view, you need to upgrade that to something that will work for your home. If they can't even go into that room because it's bringing in so much heat, that's uh, space is kind of in a way wasted. But uh, simply uh, my comments. Um, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Katz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to preface my remarks with um, saying that we, my wife and I live in a solar adobe uh, built in 1980 and with a sunroom greenhouse, very much like what you have, that is probably our favorite room in the house. And I fully understand the issue of cold in the at night um, can be very much too hot from sometimes. We love it. We spend an enormous amount of time there. Um, that said, uh, this is your house. It's not contributing. It's not visible. You get to design it the way you get to do it the way you want, as long as it um, meets our code. Uh, and I can fully understand why you would want to turn a space that is difficult to use and often not very comfortable into a kitchen that you use all the time, still with a bunch of south facing glass that will provide solar heat to that room. So with that all said, in case number 2020, 2171 at 1169 East Alameda, I would move to approve the application for the recommendation of staff Thank you, Member Katz. Is there a second? There is not a second. The motion dies for lack of a second. Uh, Member Benvenu? I'm sorry to be so slow, Madam Chair. I will second okay. the motion. Uh, thank you. A Member Benvenu has just seconded the motion. Uh, roll call vote, please. Member Beachside? No. Member Bienvenue? Yes. Member Guida? No. Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson? No. Okay. Um, Sally, can you tell me it's three no and two yes. Does the chair have to vote? Um, we have, how many of you are here tonight? Six? We're going to need four to uh, pass a motion. Wait, no. Yeah, we need four. Yeah, because that's exactly Sorry, my math is a little slow today. And I vote for yes, and that ties it. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, so um, help, uh, the motion, Member Larson. The motion fails. Yeah, no. I think that this just speaks to what we talked about with public comment earlier. Um, you know, Anthony and I discussed that this there has to be something else that can be done before we completely change that facade. Is it still in keeping with that window dominated 
exterior look, yes, but is there a way to do it in a more sensitive way to that structure? I think before we discount these 70s structures, we need to, to strongly consider that this is a prominent style that is going to become historic, if not now, then in the next near future. So what can we do to, to better preserve this and protect it, even though if it isn't significant at this moment, I think there is something to be said about the, the importance of preserving this style while we can. Do you see the photos? I'm sorry, but did you see the photos? <laughs> like just wondering. Okay, we're in the middle of a motion or a non-motion actually. We need to, I, okay, I'm going to see a, uh, that motion is tied so that fails. So I will entertain a, another motion. Let me see if anything happens. And I, or, I would uh, encourage, Sally? Um, if I could just type in too, I, I would ask makers of the motion to, if, if possible, kind of direct um, promotion to like a code provision, just so that, uh, especially if something is being approved tonight, so that we know kind of um, what your your reasoning is in terms of which portion of the code. I'm just, I'm not sure which section of the code we're relying on in terms of the um, non-visible um, internal design harmony. So I would just kind of ask that for that assistance in terms of when we draft findings and things for the board that we know kind of what you're relying on a little more explicitly. Thank you, um, Attorney Pius. Um, so let me see if somebody else has a different motion. Uh, members? Does somebody want to try something? Uh, I'll give you a, a 30 seconds to think of something that you're going to back up as the uh, city attorney indicated. Uh, Member Katz. Well, I, I would sort of taking off from what Sally said, um, I mean, I love the greenhouse. That picture is exactly what our greenhouse looks like. I'm looking forward in 10 years to applying for status for my house. But um, there's no code basis for us insisting that they keep a, uh, a style that is not particularly Santa Fe style. Um, the reason that I was able to get it built was because it was a non-visible facade. Um, and I don't think we have any basis to deny them the right to change that room from a beautiful, wonderful greenhouse that maybe doesn't work into some, a room that works for them. And I appreciate, you know, I, I love what um, Flynn and, and Anthony say about the, the greatness of that style. I'm its greatest advocate, but that's different from saying you got to do it. And I don't think we have any basis to say you got to do it. Uh, let's see, Member Guido has his hand up. Yes, sir. Member Guido, you have the floor. I, I guess I'm I'm challenged by the you know or I'm not challenged I'm 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 challenged by the design because I don't think it's sympathetic to the to the existing house um, I think it's it's quite in fact hostile to it um, I I know that this board whether um, whether it's a contributing structure or not does weigh in on um, on design guidance. Uh, for harmony with existing architecture. And so while this may not be uh, a Spanish Pueblo revival house from 1920, um, it is a significant part of our history. And so I don't think it's outside of the rights of this board um, to provide design guidance and design advice um, to, if not preserve something because it's 50 years old or more, um, uh, to recommend that the, the applicants pursue design integrity and design quality that's befitting of the property. Um, and that can be done 
it could be done in a way that meets our design standards, and it could be and it could be recommended um, as a way of, of preserving something that's in a historic district uh, that's important. Um, right now, the design solves problems and may meet the letter of of our um, our design standards for new construction, which are pretty loose, um, but in other instances, I know that we would recommend design changes um, that would be more sympathetic with existing buildings. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I, I'm wondering where you're gonna go from here. Member Beachside. Thank you. I just wanted to weigh in with some comments and just to say that I appreciate the architectural knowledge that some of um, my fellow board members bring that I don't have. Um, I do believe we have considered um, properties that are not um, of historic age, but have, um, you know, characteristic architecture that um, that is, you know, pr pr proposing design changes that may not fit that, that that style. And when I first looked at this addition, the, the addition of the divided light windows strikes me as disharmonious with the, the prominent style of the undivided light windows. And that's something we've talked about in quite a few cases um, as, you know, pick sort of pick one or the other. Um, the fact that this has an architect of some renown um, and that solar architecture is uh, becoming more and more uh, prevalent and requested of houses in the historic district, I think offers some lessons for the future that, I mean, if we get rid of all of our passive solar houses, um, you know, what do we have to rely on going forward? And I know that, that that's sort of a vague um, concern, but but I, I think there is some value in considering what was done in the past um, that is um, unique to Santa Fe. Um, uh, yeah, that's those are just sort of my my comments, and I agree with sort of the the general sense that these um, changes, while completely necessary and understandable uh, for the homeowners, um, maybe could be done in a more sensitive and harmonious way. Okay, now I'm going to ask the applicants: Do you have any comments to make in reference to what has what is transpiring here this evening? Um, I'd just like to say that we put the divided light windows in because. My understanding was that if it was visible, that's what would need to happen. So I thought that was doing something that would please you guys. Um, so I'm sorry that it caused confusion. Uh, I didn't realize that the big panes of glass were something you'd like to see. So we were even worried that the kitchen window was gonna be too big. And now I'm hearing that it's not big enough. So, um, I guess well, if we need to change it, we can. Uh, we're divided, it appears. Right. right. So it, we're not losing the passive solar nature of the home, though, is what we're trying to say. There's a whole upper story that's a it's twice as story big. Um, that's remaining. Our neighbor's house, which was built by the same architect, does not have the sunroom. So our house will actually still have more glass than theirs, if that makes any difference. Um, we're only losing a small portion of an unheated uh, room. Un There's nothing in there. Okay, let me see. Member Larson has something to say. Yes, Member Larson. Yeah, um, I appreciate the you all for the applicant for being so patient. I know that this is a it's, it's really tough to, you know, come to the board and, and present something, especially with a style that isn't really accounted for very well in, in our, our standards, really. So, I, like what Anthony said earlier, again, it's this kind of vague area of New Santa Fe. But I think in this case, um, I would recommend doing a non-divided light window. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I think that we should be in keeping with, with this, um, this architectural style in this era. Um, I think my other recommendation would be to consider just maybe looking at alternatives for energy efficiency for that, that room. Um, I don't know if there's something that can be done with 
tenting or I don't know, maybe we could explore different options there um, rather than complete change. While I do understand that, that you've, you've put an effort to, to continue that, that look, I think that we, we just, we need to be really careful here. And that's why we're having such an in-depth discussion about it as all. Well. Applicants, any comments? Further comments? I'm kind of resting just it on your shoulders. That, right, just reiterating that it is non-contributing, not visible. Um, yeah, it's just unfortunate because we have looked at a lot of different design options to make that space work um, and thought that we'd come up with something fairly cohesive. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's doesn't have historic designation as a building is my understanding. That's so, correct. Uh, um, also, we're, we're increasing the size of that room by five feet. Right, it's, it won't be the same. It's not, it's not the same footprint, the sunroom. Okay. Which may go against us, but that's the truth. It, we have, a, it's gonna be extended five feet to make room for a kitchen. Okay, let me see what member Katz has to say. Maybe something popped into his head that will solve this. Well, member I was, Katz? I was just looking at the floor plan and you know, basically they are, increasing the living area downstairs with a den that was the kitchen and they're making the sunroom into a kitchen. And the idea that just because we love that kind of style of sunroom, I don't understand any legal basis for us to say, you've got to keep it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it were historic, if it were visible, if it was visible, they couldn't have done it to begin with. But if, uh, I mean, there's no legal basis to deny them that except our, um, and it's not that it's uh, incompatible with what they have. Uh, you look at the south facades, I mean, it's still all pretty much all glass on that south facade. It doesn't have the roof glass that the sunroom has, but um, I, I don't really see a basis for denying them the right to have their house the way they want their house as long as it meets our code. Thank you. Uh, Frank, thank you. Yes. I have to, I'm going to ask you and I'll ask the rest of the board members and how do you feel about the divided lights? I'm perfectly, um, I, I think that's a very good point that the, the addition shouldn't have divided lights. It, it should match the rest of the house. We're more than happy to do no divided light. We were just trying to do the right thing for the board. Thank you. Uh, Member Guida. Uh, to the applicants, I, I appreciate and understand and apologize for the confusion over the divided light windows. This has been a, a, a matter of discussion with this board over the last several hearings about, you know, when do we follow the exact letter of what's required uh, or um, when something's publicly visible or when do we really make a decision um, that um, that benefits harmony with the house and there have been several recent cases where we have um, asked an applicant to come back with um, uh, to meet an exception criteria to to have non-divided light windows when that seemed to be the most sensible decision on the house I think, I think the question that Frank raised is, is a really good one. And, and I certainly wouldn't advocate keeping the sunroom. I wouldn't advocate doing uh, anything much different from the plan that you've already generated. Um, I think like the windows, it comes down to the details. Um, and so uh, the current expression for the addition is not sensitive to the existing building. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't design it in a way that is. And so some of the things that I would look for beyond the non-divided light windows would be um, amassing um, that, you know, continues, particularly in the kitchen, continues the original gesture of the house with the elongated walls on either side of, of those windows. That would be something that would be relatively important. I think this feature of the suspended overhangs is something that's not um, that's not native to the house and not um, not harmonious with the house. 
Um, I think the, uh, and, and I think most importantly for me, the window and wall color, um, that so many of these passive solar houses uh, were not of a light color and not with white windows and, and so on. Those are things that I would recommend looking at as a way of taking the floor plan that you have now and <clears throat> designing it in such a way that it, it better complements the existing building and still fits within uh, the, the rules that we have for, for design standards. Thank you for your comments, uh, Member Bija. Uh, Member Benvenu, did you have something? Yes. Um, just, just to sort of make my position clear, it's consistent with what Member Katz indicated, which is I just don't find any place in the ordinance that permits us to uh, deny an application based on um, perceived disharmony with the rest of the building unless it's significant or contributing. And this is a non-contributing building. And I completely respect the idea that it may be unharmonious with the rest of the building and that there are valid reasons for liking the existing building and wishing that were to be protected, but I'm not finding anything in the ordinance that permits us to do that. So that's that's where I stand on the, uh, the interpretation of the law we're applying. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to guess the, uh, that people are not gonna change their minds on this. So uh, maybe, uh, uh, Member Benvenu, did you have something further? No. Okay, sorry. Once again. Yeah, your hand went up accidentally, I guess. Um, uh, Sally, do you have any suggestions? I have to resort to the city attorney. Madam Chair? Uh, yes, Member Katz. Um, what has happened before is that there's a tie, we put it over and get our other member here and take a vote then. That's one possibility. True. Thank you, Karius. Uh, Member Katz, that's sort of where I was going. I mean, I guess, I mean, ideally in a situation like this, you could provide suggestions. Obviously providing suggestions is always good. Providing input on design is, is always good. And if an applicant is interested in, uh, you know, taking another look, that's that's great. Um, so that's one reason to postpone if there is any interest on the side of the applicant to um, consider possible changes, revisions to the to the plans, then that's certainly a good reason to postpone or um, to get uh, hopefully a fuller uh, contingent of the board. Um, it's possible that having one more member would get us a winning motion. Um, you can always try another motion and see if this uh, additional discussion has swayed any any votes? Yeah, I have a question too for staff. In reference to the windows that are now divided, and if the applicants want to do undivided lights, uh, uh, do they have to file for exceptions? Or uh, is are those windows need to be more in harmony? Visible, Pardon? Right? They're not publicly visible. Is that? It's not that's publicly not visible. I'm sorry, say that again? It's at the end of a private lane, so it's not publicly visible. This is an exception. Lisa? So no, no exception would be needed if they're not publicly visible. Okay. In case they, I mean, it appears that non-divided lights, to me, would be more compatible to, with the existing home. Uh, through this discussion, has any does anybody want to entertain another motion or are we going to postpone this case? Uh, Member Guida. I would propose a, a motion, Madam Chair. Yes, go right ahead. Um, so in, let me pull up case number, uh, case 2020-002171 HDRB, 1169 East Alameda. I propose that we postpone and ask the applicant to uh, to adjust the design uh, per board recommendations uh, on being more sympathetic to the passive solar uh, style of the house here. Um, 
specifically uh, that without changing the proposed floor plan, uh, that the detailing and expression uh, of what's being proposed um, include a darker color that's more in line with the original um, house, uh, undivided light windows uh, of a style and function um, that is sympathetic with the with the uh, with the architecture of the house. That means casement windows rather than double hungs. Um, and that the expression on the south side be more consistent with a passive solar um, original house uh, in some way, um, whether that's ex extending the, uh, the east and west walls uh, and mimicking the massing or uh, eliminating uh, the overhangs, um, but an expression that would be consistent or harmonious uh, with the passive solar design of, of the house. Thank you. Is there a second to this motion? Um, Larson seconds. Thank you. Um, Melissa, roll call vote. Okay. Member Beachside. Yes. Member Brian Venu. Uh, I'm I just want to preface my vote by saying I thought that was very eloquent and I agreed with everything that was said, except that I don't think we have the legal authority to do that, so I vote no. Member Guida? Yes. Vice Chair Katz? Um, I will vote yes to postpone, and I'm happy to have the owners think about maybe revising their the design of the kitchen, but I vote yes with the understanding that this does not obligate them to change anything other than I think the windows that they've agreed should be undivided. Okay, Member Larson. Flynn? Yes, sorry, I was muted. I said yes. Okay, the, the, the motion has been approved, but I'd like to clarify, did Member Katz, um, was that an amendment to the, the motion or my understanding the, is that the the motion was to postpone and for the owners to consider redesign but um okay. the, no specific redesign was required and if they want to tell us that they don't want to they get to do that okay and i have a question for staff do we have to do the phone oh uh the motion passed correct yes uh do we have to postpone to a date certain or whenever the applicants are ready to come back? If, if we want this to go at the next meeting on uh, July, well, even for July 14th, I, don't, I better let Lisa speak to this. She understands the, the bigger calendar better than I do since we, we have three weeks until the next meeting on July 14th, which is unusual. So, well, I think, do we have to indicate, in the past, we always indicated to a date certain. I mean, we do that if it's the very next hearing because of noticing purposes. Other than that, we do not need to. to it, it, we do not need to specify a date certain. But then you can work with the applicants uh, to see if they're going to be able to have everything ready by then. Correct. Yes, we'll be able to have it ready. Okay. So the fourteenth. That. Um, so just to be clear, if you are to go forward on the fourteenth. <coughs> have to have everything submitted by the end of this week. We can do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Uh, Member Bienvenue. Member Bienvenue. I, if that, with that clarification, if that was clarification was acceptable to Member Guida and Member Larson who seconded as being consistent with their motion, then I would approve the motion. Okay. Uh, so Member Bimpin, you just uh, switched his vote, changed his vote? Provided that that, con that was consistent with the, with the moving parties, moving members' intentions, yes. Well, actually, you you're talking about that you agree- Member Guida yeah. making the motion. I just wanted clarification because I I'm in agreement with the idea of the, the postponement and the permission to come back with the, all the ideas that Member Guida suggested, as long as it wasn't a directive of any sort. Okay. For, for 
what it's worth. Suggested redesign. Yeah, for what it's worth, in my view, a postponement is not a final action. Um, we're we're going to take a pause and take another look at this. Um, and there's been some suggestions and guidance, but uh, since it's not a final action, I wouldn't consider any of it to be sort of binding okay. recommendations. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm I'm fine with the motion then, and I would say uh, yes. Okay, thank you, uh, Member Bivenu. So if you could switch him to a yes, uh, thank you, Melissa. Okay, yes, we'll do that. Uh, thank you, applicants. Uh, good luck. Uh, next case is 2020 001978, located at 8 Camino Pequeño. This is Daniel's case. This is a non contributing uh, building. Daniel. Yes, thank you. Uh, 8 Camino Pequeño is a single family residence listed as non-contributing to the downtown on East Side Historic District. Because Camino Pequeño is a private road, the structure has no visibility from the public right of way. The structures face south onto the private road and there is some visibility from the private drive to the east. Originally built in the 1960s, about 80% of the structure was demolished and reconstructed in 2011. To 12. Lisa, you can scroll through as you feel free. It is a single story stuccoed residence with aluminum cloud windows and divided lights. This is a picture of the demolition and reconstruction in 2012. At the front of the property are two structures, a guest house and a storage structure that was converted into an expanded guest house, both finished around 11 and 2011 and 12. These structures are closest and most visible from the private street while the main house sits behind. The most prominent is the guest house, which is clear story windows facing the street. The main house and the guest structures form a courtyard in the middle. The maximum height of the structures on the property is 14 feet, four inches. The rock wall with the chimney is 16 foot, 10 inches. Now the applicant, applicant proposes the following exterior alterations. Item one, partial demolition of the north and east sides of the main northern house and construction of a circa 200 square foot addition. The addition would have a five light folding doors on the north and east sides. Item two, expand the laundry room on the north facade. Item three, demolish the 323 square foot bunkhouse on the southwest corner of the property and construct a 738 foot square foot two car garage in the same location with a height of 10 foot eight inches. The garage doors will face south away from the street. There will be a cedar clad colored old masters dark walnut. Facing the street there will be three 24 by 28 inch two over two divided light windows. Item four, construct a 100 square foot garden shed adjacent to the garage with a two over two divided light window. Item five, construct a 50 square foot addition to the master bedroom on the south facade of the main house. All additions will be in cementitious El Rey buckskin. All windows will be aluminum clad in Hampton sage and all exposed wood beams and decking will be in stained in old master's doll walnut. Item seven, restucco all existing structures in El, uh, El Rey cementitious L rate box skin. Staff recommendation, staff recommends approval of the proposed project and finds that the application complies with section 5.14-5.2 D and E. Send for questions. Thank you. And to reiterate, you did say that none of this is publicly visible. Is that correct? No, it's a private lane. There's no public visibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, Members, any questions for John for Daniel at this time? I think one of the reasons I'm saying John is because John Benvenu keeps his hand up. And when I look, I look at John's name. Sorry. So that's I'm really not renaming you, Daniel. That explains it. Okay. Sorry. That explains it. So um are the applicants present? Munger is the architect. So is it uh, Kim Unger? 
Is that the person that is? Yes. Uh, okay. So, um, Melissa, would you swear in the applicant, please? Yes. Yeah. I swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, Ms. Mr. Unger, are you there? Mr. Unger? Uh oh. How about that? Can you hear me? Yes. You yes. can. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Please state your full name and address for the record. Yes. Kim Unger, 25 Bishops Lamy Road, Lamy, New Mexico, 87540. Thank you. And I am the agent for number eight, Pequeno, uh, Camino Pequeno. Okay, Mr. Unger, you heard staff's report. Uh, do you have anything further to add? No, we just uh, uh, are trying to work with all the elements that are now part of that house since it was radically changed in the last renovation and just trying to make it function uh, for the new owner and change as little as possible. Um, he loves the way the house looks now and it's a really nice structure and we're just trying to bring it up to his standards. Okay, and what is the amount of square footage that you're adding? Oh, um, well, not, the garage is approximately 750 square feet. Uh, the other uh, additions, the extension of the master that's three, that's about 50 square feet. The bathroom is approximately 150 in that range. And then there's a, they call it the lounge, but it's like a library. Um, we're adding probably another five feet in depth, uh, about another 150, 200 square feet. So, Thank you. and then the laundry, yes, forget the laundry also. That's about 150 square feet. Uh, board members, do you have any questions for Mr. Unger at this time? It appears they don't have any questions right now, Mr. Unger. Let me go to uh, the public. Anybody from the public wishing to comment? Uh, Stephanie Beninato. Stephanie? Unmute, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. It just took me a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to say that sometimes what appears on the screen here, like the one that's up now, that's not in the packet. And I, I just kind of want to point out that um, it's, uh, I, I don't know, it, it's hard to track sometimes when what's on the screen is different than, you, I mean, you don't find it <clears throat> in the packet that's up online. So that's my only comment about this. <clears throat> Since it's a fairly new structure, it was to almost totally redone just a, a, you know, a decade ago. It's totally not visible. It's down, I, I think, is Camino Pequeño a private street? I believe it is. Yes, um, yes it so, is. So, um, you know, almost no one is gonna see it. I think there's a trail that goes by there, um, but, you know, again, it's really not very visible at all, so. I, I would think the board would approve it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, board members, if you don't have any questions or comments, uh, sir, you're not putting anything on the roof that's gonna be protruding? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, member Katz, you have the floor. Yes, I would like to make a motion in case number 2020, if I can read it. Um, 1978 at 8 Camino Pequeño. Um, I would move to follow the recommendation of staff and approve the application as submitted. And do I hear a second? Member Guida seconds. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Member Beecham? Yes. Member Beecham? Yes. Member Guida? Yes. Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson?
Member Larson, are Member you still Larson? with us? Flynn? Sorry, I went to use the restroom. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I vote yes. Okay, great. The motion has been approved. Thank you very much. And sir, that was quick. So good luck with the project. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. Our next case is case number 2020-002169, located at 831 El Caminito. This is a significant house. And this is Lisa's case. And Lisa, can we hear your report, please? Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board. 831 El Caminito is a single family residence listed as significant to the downtown and east side historic district known as the De La Pena Frank Applegate House. The earliest date, date of record for the property is May 3rd, 1845, when it was sold by Tomas de Jesus Lopez to Sergeant Francisco de la Pena for 114 pesos. However, it was likely to have been originally constructed in the early 1800s. According to a chapter on the property in Old Santa Fe today, the property purchased by De La Pena in 1845 consisted of farmland with a house of four rooms and a portal. Noted for its early 19th century Spanish Pueblo style architecture, the house was, was occupied by the De La Pena family for almost 80 years, during which time the family constructed a bedroom addition that enclosed the original East Portal, which to this day still con contains a traditional shepherd's bed. In 1925, notable 20th century writer and artist Frank Applegate purchased the home and land from the surviving De La Pena heirs. Applegate constructed a second story, two wings enlarging a central courtyard and a garage, and set about renovating the residence with quote unquote authentic Spanish Pueblo revival details, such as carved square beams, small corbels, low ceilings, and thick adobe massing. Despite his early death in 1931, Applegate and his renovation of the De La Pena home had substantial influence over the development of Spanish Pueblo revival style through the 1920s and 1930s. The Historic American Building Survey of 1941 published by the National Park Service lists the house as one of eight Santa Fe buildings of historical importance to the United States. And photographs of the home taken in 1937 are located in the Library of Con Congress. Between the years 1944 and 1963, Leo Wolmagood, an architect and associate of John Galmim and his wife Dorothy occupied the property, likely adding a large picture window to the south side of the sala or living room. Between 1963 and 1969, Jack and Louise Schaefer owned the residence and no major changes occurred. Although there's documentation that the East Wing of the, the East Wing apartment was used by various artists and professionals during that period. From 1969 to 1980, the property was owned by Linda and Hobart Durham and became the original site of the Linda Durham Gallery. And between 1980 and 2018, Gerald and Katie Peters owned the property and raised their family there. During this period, substantial modifications were made to the residence, including remodeling of the Applegate garage, construction of the Eastern two-car garage, a master bathroom addition, addition of the fireplace in the central courtyard, extensive interior upgrades and renovations, addition of a below-grade wine cellar, first floor sitting room at the southwest corner of the home, extensive additions on the north rear side of the home, window and door replacements and changes to opening dimensions, addition of a guard house, tennis courts, single car garage, and construction of a carport. Since that time, major interior reno renovations have been ongoing, as well as maintenance, repair, and restoration of the exterior, much of which was approved administratively, including mechanical and electrical systems upgrades, restoration of original floor levels, re-roofing, rehab of the exterior historic and non-historic wood features, and restoration of windows and doors, as well as restoration of historic balconies in the interior courtyard, and installation of security cameras. Those administrative approvals are attached in the packet. Now the applicant proposes the following exterior alterations, and I'll just flip through some photos of the home so you can get a little bit of a better sense of it before I move into the proposal. Some of the details. Oops. This is the non-historic carport and garage. 
And you'll see, and you'll notice in the photo that there is a, a, a superstructure here. Uh, I just want to, to make note that that is not an addition that's under construction. That is a that is a, a temporary um, structure to cover the the home to protect it from the elements while the the re roof is underway. So just don't be concerned. <laughs> that's temporary and just for the re roof purposes. And now the applicant proposes the following exterior alterations. Item one, demolish the non-historic carport, single car garage, and partial demolition of the non-historic West Portal. Item two, removal of the non-historic fireplace within the inner courtyard of the home. <clears throat> Item three, minor alterations to the non-historic portions of the residence, including um, item A, infill of a non-historic door on the north elevation and stucco to match existing. Item B, modify a non-historic window opening on the north elevation, converting the three panel window to two windows separated by infilled stucco massing. And item C, replace two non-historic doors with windows to match the existing wood windows and remove a small portal slash eyebrow associated with the door on the south elevation. And finally, item four, construct a new two-car garage out of adobe masonry with exposed wooden lintels and beams. Windows and stucco are to match the existing non-historic windows and stucco color of the residence. The north face of the garage will have a portal that extends across from the facade and ties in with the existing non-historic portal to provide extra protection from the elements for people, to, for people exiting to the main house. The garage door will have the look and feel of the 1928 Applegate garage door um, a new Dutch door style gate will be installed off the southwest corner of the compound in this area as well. And staff recommends approval of the proposed project, finding that the application complies with section 14-5.2D and E, and I stand for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. So Lisa, portions of this property are 220 years old, if my math is correct, from 1800s? The early 1800s, Madam Chair, yes. Yeah, and then from 1845, those are, yeah, 175 years old. That's and, correct. It's and, a very special property. And I will note that a large portion of the north side of this home is not historic, as well as a lot the, the portal that runs along um, this western side. And, but the uh, six proposed changes, with the exception of the uh, proposed two-car garage and with a portal. Uh, the other changes are all being done on non-historic portions of the house. Is that correct? I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm not sure I understand your, your question. Okay. What is being proposed this evening, it is being done to non-historic portions of the house? That's correct. Okay. And or not, um, yes, non historic features and portions of the house. And is, um, part of this, did I see as part of this mud plastered, or did, were they using something that looked like mud plaster? No, Madam Chair, it has been mud portions of the home have been mud plastered. Okay, You'll see, there's a yeah. there's okay. a rail that, and the, uh, the, the parapets are, are, and maybe, um, actually, I'll let Dale speak to this more specifically. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Other members of the board. <laughs> um, do other members of the board have questions for Lisa at this time? If not, if Mr. Zinn can get sworn in, please. Uh, Melissa, can you swear in Dale? Yes. yes. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I so do. Thank you. Please state your full name and address for the record. Gail Zinn at PO Box 756 in Santa Fe, 87504. Thank you. Dale, thank you for providing the history of the, the La Pena House. Well, it's, a, it's a pleasure to bring this house to the board. We've been working on it for a year and a half, but we've all been on the inside. Oh, okay. It's it's quite an extensive home, quite an extensive property. 
have you ever calculated just as a as the point of interest have you ever calculated the square footage it's about nine thousand square feet oh, okay plus okay. garages plus a guest house mm -hmm. and uh dale do you want to tell us about the uh proposals for this evening um, do you have anything for yeah, i just want to, to uh, disclose that i there's a, a piece of the history that's missing there is a very short period of time in the 1980s uh, one Frank Katz lived there with uh, Concy Bochum and uh, I did contact him. I did contact him, not to, to create any controversy, just to find out what he remembered. And basically, he couldn't remember anything. So, oh. <laughs> except for except for he might have ruined the floor. That was the only thing he could. Remember. But I appreciate that. I wanted to disclose I did have contact with Mr. Katz. Um, the projects, as previously described, are uh, all on the uh, the Peters additions, which is on the north side and the west side. That um, the corner it says in that very uh, bottom right corner, where it says by 1992, that is a entry and a wine cellar that was added by um, Jerry and Katie. Um, we are taking the portal off of that. We are taking this, you can, well, it says Peters and it says 2006 carport and garage. That's just jammed in there. I don't know what the thinking was when I designed that. Um, we've talked about it with our landscape architect and, and the owners have agreed that pulling away the garage away from that facade and putting a, a, a garage that allows the house to breathe <laughs> and, um, using elements from the original 1937 photos. Uh, this was listed in, it was in built, completed in 1929 and um, Applegate took some pretty interesting pictures because there was no landscaping. By 1937, it was list, it was shown in the Better Homes and Gardens magazine. And um, there was a picture there and that was a little more uh, substantial uh, landscaping started coming in. In this particular picture, it's just a bunch of hollyhocks. Uh, a lot of the photographs for the listing in the in the National Register were um, pictures by Ansel Adams, and he took some really great interior pictures too. Uh, I kind of like the 1921, and actually it says 21. It should be 1912 uh, oh, photograph up there. <laughs> Jesse Nussbaum took that picture, I think. And that was the Della Pena house. And there's no real date. People like to say it goes back to the 1700s. I think early 1800s would be my guess is the best you could do. Yeah, well, too bad we couldn't take a field trip, but when we get into more normal times, when that'll be. And we'll have a, a special tour. We'll have a special tour. That would be wonderful. Okay. Let me see. Uh, did you have anything more, Dale? Uh, I don't. I will go ahead and stand for, uh, to answer one of the questions, it, it does have mud plaster. It has had mud plaster continuously uh, throughout its history. Uh, a lot of people have struggled with it. And, and this, what you're seeing right now is, is mud plaster that has not been maintained for two years. Um, Katie and Peter uh, and, and, and uh, Jerry Peters had it remudded pretty much every year. Uh, and we're working on some formulas and some, and some mud colors and some sources of clay. And we're actually gonna do a better job and hopefully uh, eliminate the copper flashing. Um, and we'll have a little bit of stucco at the top that'll match very closely to the mud. So we're, we're taking and doing everything as carefully as possible. Good. This is a really beautiful piece of property, beautiful home. Let me see if board members have questions for you um, or comments. Uh, Member Larson. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say well done. Um, and then I have one question and that's just, um, I'm just curious about why there aren't canales. Um, at least from what we can see in these pictures. Well, the, that's a good question. You have a good eye. Uh, 
there is some historic canales uh, that we recovered that were all made out of one single beam. And if I might point out in this particular picture in front of you, uh, the beam that's in the second story uh, balcony there, that was the original beam in the De La Pena first floor. And it, Ap Applegate raised it up to that level. And that those corbels are not separate corbels. They are actually carved out of a single beam. Wow. So he took a big beam and carved it out so that it had the corbels built in. Uh, there were two cor uh, two canales up there uh, above that, and that that uh, particular uh, parapet was raised way too high in order to slope all the water to the north. And we're taking that back down to its original level, and we're reinstalling the two canales that were there that are in the historic pictures. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for the for the project and presenting it. And uh, yeah, hopefully that'll help with some of your water issues. Well, this is, a, a, they were done, so they didn't want to put water into that courtyard, but they had no drainage in that courtyard. So yeah. we've got drainage in there now. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? This is the chim This is the fireplace that is proposed to be eliminated. That was built in the '80s, I believe. Is that correct? Correct. It was a, a Peter's addition. I I finally got. Uh, that was what's interesting about this because there's a really great book that uh, Jerry Peters had commissioned, and it was by one of Applegate's great nieces, who did a lot of research. And it's a terrific book. But I realized it didn't really have the history of who did what from about 1970s on because Linda Durham did very little, but she did some. And then Peters added that fireplace, which we've always thought was just uh, Mars, that, that facade. And just uh, right before I submitted this application, I was standing out there with the owners. And I said, you know, everybody really hates that fireplace. They go, okay, just take it off. So I was pleased, pleased to put that in on this application. Okay, so thank you, Dale. Um, board members, any other questions or comments? It appears that there are no questions or comments right at the moment. Let me see about the public. Uh, Stephanie Beninato. Um, hi, Stephanie Beninato. I just want to say that I really appreciate that um, the additions uh, or the buildings that were put on that are non-historic are being removed. <clears throat> uh, I just um, also wonder if um, if on that uh, the De La Pena facade, the two-story facade, do you already have uh, permission, uh, you know, to change the the level of the parapet and put in the canales? Was that in this drawing? That was or? part of an administrative approval to oh. uh, restore that uh, uh, that that parapet because we were doing roofing projects, so that was kind of we had to. Uh, I don't think we had to bend Lisa's arm, but I think it was part of the administrative approval so we could move a little faster on the roofing. Okay. Yeah, and and I and I like the 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 design of the garage. I just wish that the portal that you're enclosing it could still be a little bit more open to sort of give the idea that it had been a portal. I do understand why you want it to be um, more weatherproof, but I don't, I don't know, if you know which one you're talking bit. about, Stephanie. I think it's not, where you're connecting the garage. You are putting a new garage on. You're putting yeah, a new right. garage on, and then uh, and then the portal that was there. I think you're um, enclosing it with a gate of some sort. Uh, well, we're adding have. a we're adding a gate for privacy to the backyard, uh, and that's mm -hmm. on purpose. So this is a very people wander in here all the time. So we're trying to give a designated point where we can have a point of entry. Uh, okay, and. and then and then my only other comment is that on the uh, backside of the garage, you know, it's just such a blank wall. 
that I was You're wondering talking about the, the west side, the west, the west elevation, where no. you know, if you could just even repeat, like there's a triple window, there's a if you could go back to that west elevation, so there's like a design of a triple window or just these smaller windows. If even one of those could go, like two small windows or one of the triple windows, just to break that mass up and to kind of replicate, you know look the rest of the look of the building i just think it would be a little more compatible and wouldn't sort of stick out so much so that's well it's, it's that, that is about 10 5 to 10 feet off of the property line and and the, the other people have a tall fence right next to there for privacy as well so it's it's not a facade that's really i did consider that but i felt like the little windows again it's into a garage so we added we wrapped that portal around and put windows and um a door from the garage so it could be a little place where you might sit and look out onto the west garden area whereas that is just a utilitarian there's a ramp that comes up so i don't think they really want more uh, access for we've had a lot of break-ins lately over there and we're just the fewer windows in a non-monitored area is better well anyway those were my comments thank you Thanks Thank for answering you. my question. Sure, Stephanie. Uh, let me see if anybody else has any further questions or comments. Any further questions or comments, board members? It appears not. Uh, I will entertain a motion. Member Guida. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to make a motion in case 2020-002169 HDRB. 831 El Caminito, uh, I propose that uh, the, the board approve the project per staff's recommendation. And as a side note, Mr. Zinn, this is a very beautiful project and, and, and super Thank you. thoughtful. I, I, really I think so too. Uh, the consideration that went into this. Uh, is there a second to the motion? Larson. Uh, Member Larson, seconded. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Member Beachhead. Yes. Member Bienvenue. Uh, yes, I'd also like to, to commend you on the project. It's uh, You're doing amazing work on this extremely important yeah. project. It helps to have really great odors. <laughs> Mem Member Beachhead. Yes. Yes. Member yeah. Larson. Yes. The motion has been approved. Thank you. And I also want to compliment the owners because sometimes, you know, uh, the owners may not want to do certain things, but in this case, they appear to be very preservation minded and also very open minded. So, well, I uh, just as to your point, uh, Madam Chair, is whenever I'm involved in a project like that, and clearly <clears throat> there's a big investment here, I tell the owners, you're not the owners of this property, you're just the stewards. And your job is to be the best steward you can be for as long as you can be. And uh, that really kind of opens their eyes that they, they've got something very important here and they have to be good stewards. Yeah, thank you, Dale. And good luck. And we'll see you uh, at the house for dinner. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cocktails in the, the entire board. Okay, Absolutely. good luck. And thank, all right, thank you all. Okay. Uh, next case is 2020 002194, located at 1160 Camino de la Cruz Blanca. This is at St. John's College, and this is in the historic review district. And this is also Lisa's case. So, can we hear this, Lisa? Madam Chair, yes. if I may interrupt, I, I need to recuse myself on this case. I'll oh, okay. Let the record show that uh, Anthony Guida, member Guida, is recusing himself. Thank you. And then we'll get you back, or somehow you're going to have to. Uh, we can text you. I think Lisa has your ability to text you. Yeah. She does. She does. Oh, Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. And I don't think I've got your number, but we'll we'll text you when we're done. Oh, with this we one. we need to we need to fix that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, in the lower member Guida's hand, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, 
The applicant proposes to construct a 75 foot tall monopine telecommunications tower on this campus of St. John's College. The proposed tower will have antenna, which will be hidden by design foliage and ground equipment are to be screened behind a proposed six foot high coyote fence to, sorry, having trouble advancing. Yeah. Whoa. Okay, there we go. Um, there's some photo simulations that I'll go through while I'm, while I'm giving the report. Um, the proposed tower will have antenna, which will be hidden behind design foliage and ground equipment are to be screened behind a proposed six foot high coyote fence to match the adjacent section of fencing. The purpose of the tower is to provide improved communications capability for emergency services and first responders, as well as enhanced personal wireless service in the surrounding area. As described in the packet, the, the applicant worked with the executive board of St. John's College and explored the entire 250 acre campus, including the rooftops of all buildings in order to determine three possible locations for the proposed tower. After meeting with surrounding neighbors, a location next to the parking lot near the trailhead, and I'm gonna make a correction here to Adelaide Mountain Trail, not Sun Mountain Trail, was selected because of the density of trees and the adjacent six foot high coyote fence fencing in order to blend into the surroundings as much as possible. The site was also selected to maximize coverage for the campus as well as the surrounding neighborhoods while still being able to communicate with the nearest tower located at St. John Methodist, St. John's Methodist Church on Old Picos Trail. Under Santa Fe City Code Section 14-6.2E, Telecommunications Facilities, the Historic District's Review Board must review the telecommunications application for compliance with the design requirements of Section 14-5.2 for Historic Districts and relevant subsections of 14-6.2E, and to ensure that the applicant has, and I quote, demonstrated that no other less intrusive means or alternate alternative to the proposed telecommunications facilities siting is practicable, end quote. The applicant provides length, lengthy discussion in the, mm, the applicant provides lengthy discussion in the packet regarding the decision-making process around siting of the facility, which has been summarized above. In terms of the design standards of 14-5.2, staff has determined that the applicant is subject to the height limits and scale requirements as specified in 14-5.2 D9, and that the design of the structure must adhere as closely as practicable to the design standards for the historic review district. The maximum allowable height for the site is 16 feet. Because the proposed tower height of 75 feet exceeds the maximum allowable height, for the site, a waiver is requested as specified in 14-6.28 E8C. That's another correction. <laughs> and criteria and responses are provided um, below. And I just wanna provide a little bit of detail. This is not an exception. This is a waiver that, that uses some of the same, most of the same exception criteria, just for, for clarification. A waiver is requested to exceed the maximum allowable height, which is governed by section 14-5.2 D9C, as specified in 14-6.2 E8C, the HDRB may grant a waiver of the standards set forth in the telecommunications facilities subsection, which refers to the standards in 14-5.2 for facilities located in the historic districts. If the board finds that the applicant has demonstrated that it has explored all alternatives to the proposed site and design if the board finds that the applicant has met exception criteria one, two, three, five, and six in section 14-5.2 C5C. And I know that might be kind of hard to follow, no, but I did provide um, excerpts from the packet um, for all of the waiver criteria, including the exception criteria. And those are, are, are found in your packet and because I because I found that some of the some of the criteria had not fully met, um, I defer to the board as to whether the criteria for the waiver for the maximum allowable height have been met per section 14-6.2 E8C, um, but otherwise recommend approval for the of the application in compliance with 14-5.2 D and I. Um, that said, I do recommend that the board explore some additional testimony from the applicant with regards to the waiver criteria. And I stand for questions. Thank you. So Lisa, obviously yes. this is a very tall 
uh, tree-like, <laughs> uh, faux tree, I'll call it. Uh, where exactly did you indicate it's located and its public visibility? Um. Let's see, we can go back to the site plan. So I don't know if you're familiar, how familiar you are with the college. Yeah, we've had numerous projects here. So this is the proposed location. This is the parking lot um, next to the trail easement. Um, and I, I would like to invite the applicant when we get there to provide additional information about the site, uh, the, the proposal to, or I'm sorry, the, it's getting late, um, the determination of the site location. Um, so here's a better, a better view that might give you um, a better idea of the location in relation to the streetscape. So this is Camino de Cruz Blanca that I'm showing with my little hand. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the red, the red marker and star are the proposed location for the tower. And this, these photo simulations do provide a pretty good idea of the visibility of this monopine. I'll just flip through those once again. So that gives you a better idea of public visibility for the proposed location. And the antenna are going to stick out, and they are also obviously going to be visible. Correct? It appears that way, Madam Chair. Yes. But the, 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 all of these, the foliage is designed to camouflage them, and they are painted green to sort of match the, the designed foliage. OK. Uh, any other questions, board members, at this time for Lisa? OK, it appears not. Uh, Applicant or applicants, would you get sworn in? Would you invite Sean Milks? Okay. Sean, you still appear to be muted. How about now? Go. Looks good. Sounds okay. good. All right, great. Okay. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is a truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. And if I could clarify, the antennas will not be seen. Um, the foliage of the trees will be hiding it. We did the photo sims like that, just so you could see kind of where the antennas would be. Uh, but um, uh, they'll definitely be behind the, the, the trees. We, uh, we will be you know, using um, the best technology possible in the industry, um, doing this 23 years and uh, building many sites in New Mexico. Um, I know there's some horrible looking trees out there, um, but um, we've done a, a few, one in Rio Doso, one in Los Ranchos and Albuquerque, and you, they look really, really good. Obviously we can't make them invisible, but uh, you will not be able to see the antennas unless you look extremely close. Are these, is this tree made up of the same type of composition that you see some um, fake Christmas trees that look really real? Yes, they are. Okay. Let's see, uh, board members, other board members, do you have questions or comments? Uh, member Katz. Yes, thank you. Um, it's really big. It's really visible, and it's probably visible for most of Santa Fe. Um, it needs to be, I understand that. But being so close to the road, I think, makes it seem bigger. And I didn't quite understand why there's not some other location on the campus um, across the Arroyo where the main body of the campus is in back of the dorms or someplace else that wouldn't be as uh, imposing from the road. 
Yes, this um, we've been working on this since 2009, me personally, uh, since 2009, if you can believe that. We looked at um, several different locations, one being the dorms behind, um, and it was uh, it, it was denied um, from the landlord uh, from the college perspective. Uh, we looked at three separate locations over the last year, year and a half, um, and ultimately, um, um, everyone ended up deciding that this was uh, the best place uh, with the least amount of, um, um, you know, issues. Um, understanding again, <clears throat> we can't make it invisible. Um, and yes, it is uh, quite tall um, and it's unfortunate, but there isn't any other, um, existing verticality that could be utilized. Um, we looked at every single building. We looked at going up on the top of the mountain. Um, ultimately, we have to build uh, a site that communicates with existing uh, sites in and around the area. Um, you think, so uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? So, it's called triangulation. Um, the sites, if they're too tall, they interfere with the other sites in the area. If they're too short or they're blocked by topography or buildings, then um, they cannot communicate with one another. And it's essential that it communicates with uh, other sites. This site specifically uh, communicates with the St. John's Church, which is a site I built uh, about uh, nine years ago. Um, and it's a uh, faux chimney. Um, and I, I, I apologize, I don't recall the address, uh, but Lisa alluded to it earlier. Okay, you did a very nice job on that one. Thank you. And, Thank and you. keep in mind that as, as you know, local uh, people in New Mexico, my business partner and I, who are from New Mexico, I was born here. Um, we, we understand the issues that you guys are, are coming up with and the decisions that you're making. This was not um, um, just put here randomly. This was painstakingly a uh, long process that we came up with in conjunction <clears throat> with St. John's College. Um, it should be also noted that this tree is designed and capable of providing services for all of the carriers, all of the wireless carriers to fit on this tree for future. The main goal, of course, is to cover the college um, for the emergency purposes. This is a FirstNet site. If you're not familiar with FirstNet, it's a national funded project for the first responders. And um, that is uh, why uh, it's being pushed so hard from a federal standpoint. So you don't know whether other carriers will but up there, I would think the college would want to have all of them available. Yeah, it's it's almost uh, build it and they will come. Um, we've spoken to Verizon, T-Mobile, who of course uh, uh, has gobbled up Sprint, um, and um, you know we have spoken to them. We have contracts. We build for them as well. And um, if it gets built, the other carriers will absolutely come. This area, if you've ever been here, is an extremely um, uh, problematic area. Uh, there is no coverage on the campus. Um, the students have complained about it for as long as I can remember. And, and uh, President Roosevelt and I have met several times to discuss the issues with, um, you know, an active shooter or some sort of emergency, 
And uh, that's why we've been working with the neighborhood, with the neighbors, with the students, with faculty to try and find um, uh, the right location. And this is the right location. So from the comments you just made, are you saying that uh, at the St. John's College, they don't have computers that are capable of working? They have computers, but everyone, all the students, every, you know, everyone has a cell phone and, uh, you know, walking from class or uh, being on Camino de la Blanc, Cruz de Blanca and there's an accident, God forbid, you know, uh, the, the main uh, goal is to have emergency services in this area. There is not a cell site anywhere near this location that is- so uh, Cell phones don't work there? Is that what you're saying? Correct. It's very hit and miss. You go into any one of those buildings or go in any certain spot on campus. Um, I who um, have AT&T cannot make a call. Definitely not inside of a building. Okay, let me see what other board members have to say. Uh, Member Benvenu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few questions for the applicant. Um, yes, I, I wasn't sure who who is the applicant here exactly. What's the relationship between St. John's, AT and T, and your company? Yeah, so Gravity Pad is the build a suit vendor for AT and T slash FirstNet. We have a lease with the St. John's College, and they're providing um, us uh, an area uh, off of the parking lot. <clears throat> A designated area that uh, um, nothing really it's not obstructing anything it's just kind of in a corner and uh, that's the relationship between uh, the three of us okay so did st john's college come to you to look for coverage or did you go to them to look for a site back in 2009 i approached them um, um, to try and build uh, for AT&T. Um, ultimately, it uh, was never agreed upon. Um, having uh, some more discussion several years ago and uh, coming up with some better ideas and some better technology in, in the fake tree uh, arena, um, we were able to show them how the, the trees uh, uh, look, uh, give them examples in a couple of the other parts of the state that they uh, actually went and visited. And um, that's how uh, we were able to come to uh, what you see in front of you. So between that period of time from 2009, when they said no <clears throat> to a year or so ago, did they ever come back to you and say they still wanted you to help, help them with better coverage? Yeah, they've always wanted coverage for the for the college. Um, it was just, um, you know, very difficult to go through the process. Um, not only through the historic process, but the city of Santa Fe, as well as, you know, they want to be good neighbors. Um, and it wasn't until we met with some of the neighbors and got some feedback and just kind of talked through it with several different meetings um, did we come up with um, a plan that met everybody's needs? So essentially, the you would be leasing the site from St. John's, and presumably paying them a lease a, a fee for that. Yes, sir. Okay. And are you the owner of the site or, the, or of the tower, and then you lease it to AT and T, or how does that work? Yes, I'm co-owner of Gravity Pad. They would actually own the tower. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and so with the other thing, just on the presentation, um, I, I mean, there was a lot of qualitative information about it being necessary, but I didn't see anything quantitative. Did you, do you have any studies to substantiate the need? Oh, absolutely. We have propagation studies that uh, I can share. Um, that um, essentially shows the lack of coverage uh, 
in the area um, with the tower and um, without the tower and it's substantial. So that would be, I do think you would need to share, I mean, from my personal perspective, that would need to be shared with us to meet your burden of um, the variances, but do you want to address the numbers here? What is the gap? I mean, the numbers I'd be interested in is what's the gap in coverage and what does this provide to fill the gap? And what, what, what did the alternatives provide? So the gap in coverage goes off of, of you know, DB levels um, as far as, <clears throat> you know, percentages, um, it's more so of a map. And the map will show the area and, and colors. Um, and I could tell you that, um, you know, just to clarify, uh, probably 88% of the area is not covered or does not have in building coverage. Um, furthermore, there is a uh, capacity issue. Everybody's on their phones, everybody's texting and, and doing all their social media and, and uh, the, the, the sites that are around it aren't able to uh, uh, not only carry a phone call, but um, have any sort of um, uh, communication with, uh, with social media, texting, uh, or emergency services. So with well, the that, power- That sounds qualitative again, but I'm wondering, yeah. is there a number you attach to that gap? Yeah, again, without the tower, it's at about 88%. With the tower, it's covering um, um, almost 98% of it, of the area. So it's significant. And what did the alternatives cover? Did you look at the, the alternatives, there, there really wasn't any alternatives. Um, the alternatives that we gave to the college um, were not uh, uh, approved to uh, move forward with. So we looked at, again, different areas on the college, but as far as providing propagation studies, um, it didn't get to that point. Because they didn't, they just rejected it for other reasons? Correct. Okay, so we don't actually know whether there are other alternatives other than this site that would meet the coverage requirements. Correct. And did you do, what would the coverage be if you had um, a um, poll that was three quarters of this height of this one? Well, it would be significantly lower, um, not to mention it has to um, communicate with what I said before, the St. John's uh, um, uh, church, which is uh, about 1.8 miles away. Right, but have you actually, again, tried to put numbers to that? What difference it would make to have a lower pole? Yeah, so propagation studies basically that came back from um, our RF department um, uh, dictated the height of this tower um, where it is now. Um, the going lower would uh, basically not work because it well, could would, not, it could it not communicate with the other site. You mean it just literally would be of no value whatsoever? you know, they don't, they can't have just island sites, sites that do not communicate because it's in it, it has to speak to the other, um, to the other sites. So it, there's not a line of sight to the other one. Okay. Yeah. And my only other question then for now would be, what's the highest tree within 300 yards of this also this tree that you're putting, would like to put up? Um, we flew some drones um, and I don't have an exact number um, off, uh, off the top of my head, but that's uh, um, something that I guess we could measure possibly uh, with an inclinometer. Um, I just don't, don't know. Okay, well, just judging from the photos, it, it doesn't look like there's any significant tree cover nearby. Would you agree with that? 
you know, that photo we're looking at there is, uh, uh, it doesn't look like it, but uh, there are some other tall trees in the area. Lisa, you could go to one of the other propagations or um, photo simulations. Yeah. So, you know, probably 40, 45 feet. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Member Benvenu. Uh, Member Leedscheid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a, a question. I wonder if you might be able to elaborate on the other potential design um, or location options for this tree. And I understand it's difficult to disguise, but it seems particularly incongruent with the surrounding location um, at a trailhead and on the way to a, an extensive trail system. It just stands out as very unnatural. And it, it looked like you had considered some locations further away from the street. Um, and I'm not clear why those wouldn't work. Was it only because of neighbor objections or are the college objected to that location? Yeah, it was both. Um, and uh, the, the sites simply did not perform um, as well as this one. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is uh, have a delicate balance between what it looks like versus having uh, us build only one. Um, and, you know, having building only one that will accommodate the other carriers um, with other RF systems is, is, is extremely difficult. And uh, getting that's, you know, everyone to agree on one site, uh, especially our landlord, which is the college, um, you know, um, this, this was really the, the only location that uh, the board would approve. Um, and would other locations work or is it just, was it just the objection to the design or the height of this or is it just that it would not function? One location um, that was near the dorms um, that was, of course, voted down uh, would work, um, but the propagation studies came back and they were about, uh, they performed about uh, half as, as well as this one. And Not to mention the pole uh, was, um, you know, blocked by some trees and, and the building, and it was only going to be a one carrier site because of the, 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 lo the location of it. Um, this one, of course, uh, is uh, going to be capable of all of the carriers with FCC wireless uh, um, capable. Um, um, uh, contracts with uh, the FCC. You know, we had essentially 250 acres um, to work with. And like I said, we, we worked on it for over a decade to try and find uh, the right location, the right spot. Any other questions of member Beachside? Oh, and you're muted, but um, I wanted to ask you, um, Mr. Milks, did, um, could you put this in a, in a chimney location, in something that isn't as prominent as this tree? We looked at every single building on campus, including the existing bell tower. Um, and uh, there was just nothing anywhere close. Um, unlike the St. John's uh, one that I built uh, at the church there, unfortunately there was not anything um, uh, on campus. Furthermore, we even went and looked uh, at the high school down the road, uh, try to go on the gym. I mean, we've, we've been, this is, this is, I think, candidate G and that starts at A. And so um, if this 
if this one doesn't get approved, I think we're 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 pretty much gonna give up. <laughs> uh, let's see, Member Larson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I think that this this project shows just how far these towers are going. You know, they it does look a lot more realistic. Does it blend with the R vegetation? Maybe not, but is this the closest that we're going to get with the current technology? Probably. And I think that their study and presentation has proved that. Um, I think in, in this case, especially where you can see that this angle, I, I don't know that it's going to impact the views from the trails or, even from the streetscape as as um, as much as as we seem to have the impression of. Um, so for me, again, I, I think that this is one of those situations where we have to make somewhat of a compromise for this for public safety. And I think you know they've they've explored all of the alternatives. And I think that in this case, this, this really isn't all that bad in terms of visual um, disruption to the landscape. Um, but I, I understand if others disagree with me. I just, I think that, you know, they've gone through the whole research process and I think that is the, the best that we're going to get. And, and you know, still provide that safety piece that is really important for being out in those that trail network, especially. I mean, I know I've gotten stuck out there before without <laughs> without a map. So I, I think that you know having that that capacity is going to be really important, and I think it'll really help our community. Thank you, Member Larson. Member Katz. I do appreciate the safety factor, but along the lines of what John Bienvenu was saying, uh, your letter talks about these propagation maps and such, and I'm not entirely clear I understand that, but I think just being able to see those maps, some visual display of what this does and what the alternatives would do would have really helped us a lot on this. Okay. Yeah, um, it, when we go in front of city council or the planning uh, board, uh, you know, um, we, we give that to them. It, it was my understanding that, um, you know, this was just from an aesthetic standpoint. I didn't really uh, realize or was told that, you would need any sort of the um, um, propagation studies or the RF engineering that goes involved. So um, I can definitely um, give that uh, uh, to Lisa, but even if, you, you know, Vice Chair um, Katz, if you had it in front of you, unless you were an engineer and I've been doing this 23 years, it's, it, it, it looks like chicken scratch. I mean, it, it essentially, uh, gives you DB levels um, before and uh, after. It's, uh, it's just very difficult to uh, kind of uh, comprehend. Um, it's not uh, as clear cut as one would think. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, if, it, if, it were, if you were living and dying on aesthetics, you would be dying all the time. We recognize that yeah. it won't be beautiful, but our, our brief, I think, is to see, is there another place that would be less prominent? Yeah, unfortunately, um, I have been all over this campus um, to the point where I'm trying to convince my daughter, who's going to be a senior, to go to school here because um, I feel like uh, uh, I know the college better than most students. Um, I'm very confident in, in saying this, that there is not. There is not a better spot, both that will hide it the best and that will meet the coverage objective for AT&T and FirstNet and the other carriers. Um, 
And the main objection is, of course, um, the emergency services. Um, and it's in dire need of that. And so, um, again, uh, uh, there, is, there is not a better location than this right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board members, any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Member Benvenu. Well, just to follow up, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, the, you do have the burden of, of, a, of demonstrating that you've explored all other alternatives, which is why we're asking the questions about yeah. the, the factual data that backs up the assertions. But you know, one of the questions is not, in my mind, just the propagation study, it's what is what you just described as the coverage objective of AT&T. I mean, we don't know what that is. That could be beyond what St. John's needs for emergency services. So without, without that level of information, we don't know how necessary this particular tower is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to open it for public comment. Uh, Stephanie Beninato. Madam Chair, uh, just a, a reminder for myself, more than anyone, um, I do have two written comments that I that I received past the deadline, but um, would like to submit them to the record for the record once we have received public comment from the floor. Okay, I will call on you after um, get the public comment. Stephanie Benanato. Hi, excuse me, Stephanie Beninato. I appreciate um, the questions being asked by um, uh, Member Katz and um, Bienvenu, and also the comments by um, uh, Member Bishaid. Um, I think it really is sort of symbolically inappropriate to have this fake tree by a trailhead. And um, if this had been such a big problem at St. John's, I think they would have done something about it you know, 10 years ago when supposedly they first were entertaining talks about what is really a commercial venture by a third party on somebody else's land. And, um, you know, this is the X amount of times they've tried to get this. And what what does the college object to really about it? I, I, I have a feeling that the college doesn't want this close to the buildings, but it's perfectly fine if it's someplace close to the road. And really it's probably about three times the size of any tree by it. And although it might be good enough or as best they can do, I think still the uh, consideration of what are the alternatives and the burden of proof on this um, company uh, to show that this is the only, really it is the only location and that it is a hardship um, not to have it to serve all other carriers, things like that. And I would ask that you postpone and require uh, the applicant to submit the data that backs the assertions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Eddy. Mr. Eddy, you have the floor. John Eddie, are you there? Just a moment. It just takes a second. Okay, yes. Sorry. Madam Chair, board members, I think that board member Bienvenu struck on a very, very salient point in his uh, words that he spoke. I would like the proof uh, from the applicant that this apparatus does not go way beyond the needs of the immediate area because I have a suspicion that it probably does and is serving a much greater need for a corporation in terms of their outreach and their, the business that they do nationwide. Having said that, this structure is completely inappropriate in this landscape. A fake tree is a fake tree is a fake tree. And I agree that St. John's College probably didn't want this within the boundaries of their campus. And they're more than happy to put it on the side of Camino Cruz Blanca, where everyone that travels over to 
of the uh, Crystal Ray neighborhood, Canyon Road, will see it. And it is undeniably an obstacle in the landscape. And it really cuts down on, I think, our quality of life as Santa Feans and people visiting Santa Fe to have to see this kind of thing in our landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eddy. Um, there's a person there named that has his hand raised. Kevin, are you a person that wants that it wants to uh, comment? Yeah, is there a way to unmute the audio? Uh, yes, you just did. You have the floor. Thanks. Yeah, um, I, need, I think you have to get sworn to in. Okay. Um, do, you, do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Please state your full name and address for the record. It's Kevin Winner, P.O. Box 2755, Corrales, New Mexico, 87048. Thank you. And, um, Winter, you yeah. have the Thank you. Yeah, actually, um, I work with Sean. Uh, we worked on the, many of these sites. And I had the pleasure of going and hiking the Adelaide Mountain Trail a couple of weeks ago. And I suggest that some of the board members might do that as well. It's about a 2.8 mile round trip hike. And to kind of step back away from the views that you're seeing, yes, obviously if you're standing at the, you know, the base of the tree or coming around the bend, yes, you'll notice that there's a tree there, but the design isn't so that it's not noticeable. The design is so that it blends in with the existing area. And so to say that a tree is not a compatible use in an area with other trees is just um, sort of an oxymoron there. And so the design is subject to being able to have it blend in from a distance. So as you're walking the trail, as you gain elevation and you're looking down the valley below, the tree blends because of the color and the foliage with the other trees. And same thing from the college. As you're looking across the valley, because it's below the ridge line, you don't see a silhouette. And so we looked, we worked with the city of Santa Fe on a silhouette study and basically putting the tree, we could build a taller tree on top of the mountain, but then it would be silhouetted and view, you know, viewable by a, a much larger area. And so the, the bottom of the, the tree is designed to be near the base of the canyon. So it's at one of the lower points, but because it's a lower elevation, the tree needs to be taller. So yes, it does need to extend up above the height of the adjoining trees so that the signal is not blocked. And so I just would encourage the board to do some additional research, either hiking in this area um, as Sean mentioned, we built this sort of same design of a tree in the Albuquerque area in the Four Hills Country Club in Rio Doso. We recently built this tree in Tejeras. And we get a lot of favorable comments from the neighbors because, yes, while you look at it, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're looking for it, obviously it's visible. But the design is that so some people won't notice it. And if it's, you know, in the periphery and if it's lower than the, the silhouetted you know, hillsides, then it does blend in. And so we built a lot of these trees in Durango as well. And so anyway, it is sort of the most appropriate design for the area. You know, we looked at other things, you know, we've looked at alternative designs, but ultimately I feel like this is the most appropriate and we're open, you know, to any kind of mitigation that, you know, might be interested in either planting additional trees or, you know, designing something so that it doesn't just, you know, sort of stand out as it's shown in this simulation but looking at ways to mitigate the view as well with the coyote fence and some other options that we're open to. So I just wanted to add that and, and encourage you know, everyone to do a little bit more you know, research on this type of design because you know, we've seen trees that have been built you know, in the past 20 years and a tree is not, you know, every tree is not created equal. This one will have bark, you know, faux bark at the base of it and the antennas are covered by socks that have actual needles on them. So the technology has, you know, come a long way for sort of these, you know, higher end, more visible uh, locations. And that's, you know, really what we've spent a lot of time and money into the design. And so I would just think that Mr. that would be Mr. Winter, I, I have let you go and read because it seems like you're uh, perhaps part of the applicant's team and not just uh, providing public comment, but you are past the two minutes. I just kind of wanted to note that I'm kind of treating you as part of the applicant's presentation at this point. I wasn't sure if that was true. Oh, that's true. And then the only other comment I had, I asked it online as well, is maybe just to brief the board on the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that talks about, um, you know, locating and siting of wireless communication sites. 
I'm happy to I'm answer to, questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Winter, I was going to ask, are there any other, any trees such as the one you are proposing anywhere in San Pepe? Yeah, I actually built a tree at um, the Jaguars High School. And that tree is not a good design. It's 100 feet tall and it's almost more like a pipe cleaner. And so those antennas are visible. And so that's a good example of a bad tree. There's a couple other bad trees on Highway 599. So those trees have been built over the last, you know, 10 to 15 years and the technology has improved greatly. Uh, we built a tree into Harris last year and it's an 85 foot tree and we've had really good favorable response from the neighbors. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Winter board members? We see. Uh, Mr. Katz, did you have a question for Mr. Winter? Yes, I did. Um, I, I'm concerned that we're not getting more information. Um, pictures of these wonderful new trees you've done. That would really help us. Okay. Uh, a, a map of this area that would be multicolored that said, this is the service that they get now, good, medium, bad. Um, and this is what the service would be with this map, good, medium, bad. I mean, it doesn't need to be rocket science, but it needs sure. to be visual so we understand that yes, this will make a difference. And, um, you know, why wouldn't the uh, Santa Fe prep work? Why wouldn't the Las Miradores um, uh, condos across the street work? Uh, you know, I, I, we need to satisfy ourselves that this isn't, that what you're telling us is true. And um, I, you, you might sense a little bit of um, reluctance for us to just accept the word of the proponent that, well, gee, we tried everything else and this is the only thing we can do. Well, you need to show us that, I think. I think I certainly, yeah, I, I welcome the opportunity. And so maybe what's appropriate this evening is to just postpone this matter to a time where we can provide more information. As Sean mentioned, we've spent 11 years on this and we really feel like it's you know the best design. Coincidentally, I don't know that there's been a tower built in Santa Fe in the last 10 years under the ordinance. And so going in, it's, you know, we knew it was going to be a difficult um, location. And that's why you have a local company doing it. Um, a lot of national companies wouldn't invest the time and resources uh, that it would take to get this approved. So we're happy to just, you know, table this discussion for another day, provide those propagation maps. I'll give you some trees. I'll give you the tree design. I mean, we take great lengths to, you know, we can come up with how many branches per foot you'd like to see. I mean, I think the focus though is, you know, why not Santa Fe Prep? Why not here or there? I mean, there's a lot of residential homes in this area. And so as far as landlords go, we don't have a lot of options. And keep in mind, it, since you mentioned it is a commercial, you know, opportunity, we can't really force, you know, there may be easier locations or, or maybe even like a better location from a coverage objective, but unless we have a willing landowner, yes. uh, there's no certainty there. And so that's why we work with the biggest landowner. We work with the benefactor that donated the land to the college. And so, you know, as far as this location and, and the types of design and how we can mitigate it, we're happy to have that discussion. Um, you know, why didn't you go here or there or everywhere? That's sort of a tougher one to have because, you know, we don't have eminent domain abilities like the utility companies do. So we really have to, you know, it's a very good balancing act between, as you said, the, you know, the landlords have an interest, the community, the college, the, the, the companies. So anyway, we, we're happy to provide much more information. If it's July 14th that we want to maybe reconvene, we're happy to have that information to you guys as early as next week. Well, thank you, Mr. Winter, for all your comments. And um, there was another person that is uh, from the public that wishes to speak. Uh, Joy McCarthy, is that correct? Joy McCarthy. Uh, so you appear to be muted still. Are you able to unmute your microphone? Mahaffey, I guess is the last. Okay, one. I think we're unmuted now. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Kathy. I'm her husband. 
And, okay. Uh, um, if you could please be sworn in by our stenographer, Melissa, and then give your name and address for the record, and then I'll start your two minutes. Okay. Okay. You swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, so help me God, I do. Thank you. And uh, would you state your name again? Art McAfee. Okay. And my address is uh, 2220 Wilderness Meadow Road in Santa Fe. And I'm a neighbor of uh, St. John's College. And um, I don't, it seems like many of the members of the, of the uh, um, committee here are not familiar with the cell phone coverage in the southeast side of Santa Fe, but it's really terrible. Um, and we live more and more every day in an electronically connected world. And uh, public safety is uh, a very big concern for us. Uh, when our telephone goes out, we have no way of communicating with the outside world except to drive down past St. John's College before we get a cell signal so that we can, we can call someone. Uh, I'm unable to give out my cell phone to anybody to contact me because it doesn't work at my house and messages will go to voicemail and I won't hear about them for a couple of weeks. So I just don't give it out anymore. So I have to depend on a, on a landline that's not totally reliable, but, but uh, maybe 95% reliable. Uh, when I'm doing transactions on, online, I cannot do two-step verification because uh, they wanna send me a text and I can't receive a text unless I drive down past St. John's College and, and uh, uh, turn on my cell phone to receive the text and then drive back up the hill. Um, another thing that may appeal to the city here is resale values. Uh, without modern te telecommunications capabilities, uh, the land values in this corner corner of Santa Fe are, are going to reflect that. And uh, if our resale value is higher, the city gets higher taxes every year from us too. So I think that it's mutually beneficial for us to move forward and do this uh, tree. It's very well disguised. I drive by that uh, area every day, sometimes that area. And I don't think it would be objectionable to anyone uh, unless they were standing at the base of it, looking up at it and say, what a big thing this is. But it's, it's really essential, I think, for, for the city to permit improved telecommunications coverage in this quadrant of the city. And that, that is about two minutes there. I'm done. Oh, perfect. perfect timing. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Uh, Member Larson. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just had one more thing to add, and it was just um, that I think the applicant proposed to offer more um, vegetation screening um, in addition to the fencing that they're going to be putting in. Um, I just hope that we can see that in the next proposal um, when we reschedule um, or when we postpone the hearing. And um, also, I just want to reiterate again, um, you know, we, we work or I work with the National Park Service and I have for three years and I've seen a lot of proposals for cell phone towers in our national parks. And um, I think that this is pretty much in line with, with what our standards are and and screening and, you know, just the, the absolute need, you know, to, to still provide that safety factor. So, you know, I'm looking forward to, to seeing more data so we can make the most informed decision possible. Maybe there are better locations. Um, so I appreciate the openness and uh, willingness of the applicant. And just this discussion as a whole, I think has been really interesting. Thank you, Member Beachside. Madam Chair, um, before we go back to board discussion, I do have two two written comments that I need to get into the public. Oh, yes, sorry, I forgot, Lisa, go right. My ahead. apologies, I don't mean to delay. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, so the first one is from Ushana Spring, um, who states that cell phone towers, no matter how camouflaged or in, or in indigenously ugly, the spot chosen for this megalith will not be appreciated by hikers, St. John students, and the many visitors to that area. Surrounding neighbors, neighborhoods are likely to see a property value decline. No matter what the telecoms tell you, you as our Historic Preservation Board have the right to say no. Thank you for a no vote on this issue. And then we have one other letter from Arthur Furstenberg, um, who states that the HDRB must review this application for conformity with all requirements of SFCC section 14-5.2 and with all requirements of section 14-6.2E. Quote, a tower or antenna that is located in a historic district and is not otherwise permitted or administratively approved shall be reviewed and approved by the historic district's review board in accordance with applicable requirements of section 14-5.2 historic districts and in accordance with this subsection 14-6.2E. This tower and end quote, this tower is in a residential R1 district. It is not, quote, otherwise permitted, end quote, under any of the exceptions listed in 14-6.2 E2B129. It is not eligible for administrative approval under 14-6.2 E3A because it is not the addition of an antenna, antenna to an existing structure, the relocation of an existing tower, a new tower in a C2 I1 or I2 district, a face mounted or roof mounted antenna, a tower alternative outside of residentially zoned districts. The city code therefore requires H board review for conformity with all requirements of section 14-5.2 and 6.2E. This application is not complied um, with, basically is calling out the exception, I think the uh, 14-6.2 E6B2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. All development within the city must also further health and the general welfare. SFCC section 14-1.3A. This project damages health and the general welfare, which is why I oppose it. It's signed Arthur Furstenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair, that is all. Thank you. Uh, Member Beachy, did you have something to say? I did, thank you. I just, um... I just wanted to comment that I, um, I think I don't think anyone likes the design of these um, structures, but I think this might be the reality from what I understand of of how we get this kind of service. Um, I can attest to the fact that the need is real. I live not far from this lo proposed location. Um, there are also at least four or five schools in this area that really do need. Um, reliable cell phone coverage for safety. Um, so I'm concerned about that. And um, Mr. McAfee's comments about the hardships of um, the neighborhood um, closer to the mountains um, is, a, is a real um, problem for, for people that live in that area. So I hope that we can come to some sort of agreement, although it's um, maybe not a perfect arrangement, it might be what, what is necessary, but I would appreciate sort of a more thorough um, presentation of the realities of the situation from the applicant. Thank you. Um, it appears that we have no more comments from board members, so I will entertain a motion at this time. Member Katz. Yes, I would move to postpone to the July 14th hearing for additional information. Is there a second? Beachside second. Thank you. Um, roll call vote. Um, member Beachside? Yes. Member Brian Venue? Uh, yes, and if I could just make a, a comment to, for, uh, by way of explanation, I just want, from my perspective, the propagation maps that I think you're planning to bring back to us would not be quite sufficient. I would like, to me, the most important thing would be to know what is the gap in coverage and what's the least, is this the least obtrusive alternative to meeting that gap, not other objectives? And that, that would be the information important to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh, member Guida. 
Oh. He was he was excused. Recused on this matter. That's right. He, he recused. That's right. Uh, Vice Chair Kim. Yes. Member Larson. Yes. The motion has been approved. Uh, thank you very much. And applicants, we look forward to seeing you uh, at our next meeting. And Madam Chair, if I may. The proper information, yes. Um, if, if I could get that additional information from the applicants by no later than Monday, that would be, um, that would be extremely important. Okay, and if they would kindly take into consideration um, the information that member Benvenu uh, requested. Okay, thank you. And Lisa, just a reminder to alert Anthony that we're moving on to the next uh, agenda item. Yeah. I see him. <laughs> Back. I think uh, thank you. Thank okay. um, you. Right. I don't have to leave anyone out here. Okay, so um, we have a discussion item. And uh, I believe Lisa will tell us about this. Just a moment, Madam Chair. I'm just going to move applicants around for a second. I'm going to bring forward Colleen Gavin. Um, and I will provide my report. And Colleen has a presentation that she would like to give as well, I believe. Okay, so, and excuse me, this is case 2020-002188, located at 500 Montezuma Avenue. And this is under discussion, but uh, anything that the board, uh, is the board supposed to make a motion this evening? The board will provide review and comment on this case per, per subsection M of 14-5.2. So it's just review and comment, correct? That's correct. And no then and that pertains to the specific design requirements in, in subsection M of sort of state capital outlay projects. Yeah, and you said no motion, correct? I believe that's correct. If Sally okay. could confirm, that would Just be helpful. Review and comment, and no motion, okay, because comment. she's nodding her head, yes. Okay, so Thank Madam Chair, you. members of the board, are you ready for my report? Yes, certainly okay. are all of us. Mm -hmm. 500 Montezuma Avenue is the former San Francisco Market Center located in the West Side Guadalupe Historic District. The San Francisco Market Center building and the parking sheds on the north side of the building are listed as non-contributing. And the Butler and Foley building at 550 Montezuma Avenue is listed as contributing to the district. The San Francisco Market Center served as a boutique mall for nearly 30 years. Prior to the establishment of the mall, the buildings, the buildings on the property um, comprised two building supply companies, the Dedro Coal and Lumber Yard established in the 1880s and the Santa Fe Building Supply Company established in the 1920s and operated through the 1970s. The building styles of the supply company at the time include the Italianate, the, the Italianate brick building at the southeast corner building, which you see here on the right, um, vernacular style sheds, the Spanish Pueblo revival elements, as well. The Butler and Foley building constructed in the territorial revival style was constructed in approximately 1930 in the south second story elevation with its clear story windows in the east elevation along Montezuma Avenue are designated as primary. In 2016, the applicant received approval from the HDRB to construct extensive, um, extensive phase one remodel of the buildings for the purpose of adaptive reuse as the New Mexico School for the Arts. Then in August of 2019, the applicant received approval from the HDRB to complete phase one, including demolition of a portion of the, the main south elevation and construction of a new exterior wall in that location, which would form the north wall of a proposed courtyard. At the same hearing, the board denied the request to demolish the former Pronzo restaurant building, suggesting that they would need to see the design of the proposed replacement structure in order to determine if the unique street section or block front would be reestablished following demolition. Um, now, due to a change in funding for phase 2A, the pro and, and I believe ownership as well, the project comes before the board for review and comment under 14-5.2M, state capital outlay projects. Just going to keep scrolling through some of these photos. Um, 
in reviewing the project, the board should specifically address the compatibility of the project with the design standards, considering reasonable costs and preserving essential functionality. The applicant proposes to construct a 7,550 square foot cafeteria addition accessed from the West Music wing corridor of the existing structure. Scroll forward. Um, so you see here the proposed location for that cafeteria addition. Um, this will open onto an 8,830 square foot courtyard to the east. The design of the addition matches the style of previously approved alterations to the exterior of the existing structure and scale, height, and materials. The storefront door and window patterns of the previously approved east and south elevations are repeated in the design of the east elevation of the proposed cafeteria. And the same Centria, uh, Centria metal panel siding in chromium gray is proposed for the exterior finish of this elevation. Um, a horizontal trellis or fin is proposed to provide shade. I need to get to the upper elevation. There it is. Okay. Um, to provide shade and design interest at this elevation and the proposed height of 18 feet, nine inches on the east and 20 feet on the west lower grade matches the adjacent roof line. The central portion of the cafeteria additions east elevation will bump up to just over 25 feet in height and features extensive fenestration. That's here. Uh, this portion of the design does not comply with the design standards in that the glazing exceeds 40% of the total elevation. Um, however, the board may find that the proposal is in keeping with the overall architectural style of the renovated structure. Opposite the proposed courtyard, the western facade of the historic brick structure will be refurbished to its original finish once the demolition of phase one is complete. An existing first floor doorway is proposed to be infilled with a glass door in this area, and an attic opening will be filled in with brick to match the surrounding facade. Within the courtyard itself, the existing grade change um, will be accommodated by a raised scored concrete patio, which steps down to the west. We even have, we'll just keep going. <laughs> a large lawn will be created to allow for outdoor school activities and gathering. The courtyard will be, the courtyard will be enclosed by a six to eight foot high fencing and gates to match the existing fencing located on the southeast corner of the music. And so staff defers to the board for review and comment on the proposed project addressing compatibility of the project with the design standards, considering reasonable costs and preserving essential functionality per section 14-5.2 M state capital outlay projects. And I stand for questions, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Does any of this project call for uh, solar panels? I'm not aware of that portion of the project. If, if, if so, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, any other questions, board members, at this time for Lisa? Uh, Member Katz. Yeah, I was wondering um, whether notice was duly given to other historic preservation organizations as required by the code. Um, I'm not aware of that portion of the code, Frank, if you could point me directly specifically. Yeah, on section two, procedures, P. You're supposed to, con the, the board and the applicant conducts a public meeting to receive public input. Notice of the public meeting should be given to any identified community groups involved in historic preservation in Santa Fe. And then there's the whole 60 day period to review and for us to submit comments and to talk with the applicant about resolving any issues. And, and then the city council has the opportunity of invoking the state, state local H board if it's not resolved. Madam Chair, I'm not, I'm not aware of, of a specific requirement to reach out to individual groups. We did notice this properly according to the standard noticing procedures. Well, the, I, I well, the There is a 60 day pro a comment period that this begins starting today. 
the notice of the public meeting shall be given to any identifiable community groups involved in historic preservation in Santa Fe. I would think at least Oslo would qualify for that. And there may be other groups. Um, Madam Chair, more board members, this is Colleen Gavin, our representative. Uh, may, that, may I be acknowledged to answer that question? Okay. Uh, hang on, Colleen, because okay. uh, you're going to have to get sworn in. And I was going to look to Sally if she has any comments. And I was just going to ask, actually, if, if that responsibility falls on the city or the state. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm looking at, I think what um, Member Katz is looking at is in the ordinance, state capital outlay projects, procedures um, 2A, the state shall make every reasonable effort to obtain input from members of identifiable community groups involved in historic preservation in Santa Fe. So I, I do think that's uh, something we should uh, inquire with the applicant or whatever we call the um, our co-collaborator on this project. I don't know if this is quite an application. I guess it is an application still, right, Lisa? Yes. Okay, so the applicant. Okay. So hang on a little minute. I want to see if any other board members have anything at this time. And if Member Katz, uh, are you done for mm -hmm. right now? Yeah, Member Katz is done. Okay, if you can swear in the applicant. Yes. You swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. My Thank name you. Is Please Colleen. state your full address for the record. Uh, yes, Colleen Gavin, 130 Grant Avenue. Thank you. Well, hi, Colleen. What do you have to tell us about this big project? <laughs> uh, good evening, Madam Chair, board members. Um, thank you for staying up so late for this. I, I appreciate it. Um, may, may I go ahead and um, um, put my presentation on the screen? Yeah, absolutely. I believe you're able to do that. Okay, here we go. Uh, are you seeing my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hold on a moment. I moved it to my other screen. Let me. Uh, okay. That that'll have to work. Okay. So um, so board members, uh, Madam Chair, um, I am Colleen Gavin with Jenkins Gavin, and I will go through our presentation um very briefly because I I know it is late. We've had a very long hearing. Um, um, also on uh, the um, meeting this evening, we have um, Eric Kreitz, who is head of school for New Mexico School for the Arts. We also have Paula Tackett, who is the, um, the secretary for the governing board. We have Mary Sloan, who is, the, um, who is a board member with the Art Institute, as well as Eric Meese, who is our project architect with SMPC, and um, his team, um, Peggy Favor and uh, Glenn Fellows. And so, um, first of all, um, board member Katz, I would like to just address your question in regards to uh, the provision of 14-5.2 um, M to A. Um, yes, indeed, we did reach out to the identifiable, uh, identifiable neighborhood groups. Uh, those two groups were identified as the Old Santa Fe Association and the Historic Guadalupe Neighborhood Association. We notified them of a neighborhood meeting two weeks in advance, we, we held that meeting on June 10th. Nobody attended that meeting. We kept that, um, that go-to meeting live for 30 minutes. Uh, we do have minutes that were submitted to the city uh, for the record, as well as our notice. And I do have that slide presentation available if the city requires, but I did send that to the city for the record uh, last week. Um, or actually at the day after our meeting, the 11th of June, showing our minutes from the meeting, identifying the members of our team that were present, that the meeting was live for 30 minutes and that nobody from the public attended. I did, I did include that in the packet, by the I, way. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I did include that in the packet. I just wanted to make sure that, that you were aware. Yeah, and so I did um, reach out to both parties the day before, just as a reminder. I know that in this odd time, 
um, that often, you know, people are being inundated with emails. And so I made sure that I reached out again, just to make sure they were aware. And I never did hear back from either of you. So um, we, did, um, we did comply with that requirement. Thank you. You're welcome. So I will just um, briefly go through this again. I know that, that many of the board members are very familiar with the property. I know there's a few more board members who were not part of the previous approvals. So real quick, we'll just go through uh, this presentation. Here again is a rendering that Lisa showed in her presentation of that interior courtyard. Um, as she described in her staff, here's an aerial real quick. You can see here, this is Montezuma Avenue, Agua Fria. We have um, um, Market Street here, and here is the existing school here. And you see this beige section in the section in the middle. This is the area that is that was approved in November of 2019 for demolition um, through this board. And that area is completely gone now. And I do have photographs to show that to you. <laughs> here you can see the, the historic um, review map identifying this as part of the West Side Guadalupe District. And again, this is our existing condition now. Um, this is the entry to the school here. This is the old Pranzos just for, um, for um, uh, location. Again, this is the, the void essentially that we have currently um, that has is the result of the demolition that is, is uh, about 75% complete. So here you can see this, this photograph was taken two weeks ago, yes, or tomorrow, pardon me. And you can see here, here's the historic gallery building. And here in the, in the distance, you can see the, the old borders building with that fake, with that kind of facade storefront being um, removed. Coming in here, you can see again, here's the historic building. Here we've preserved this east, excuse me, west facing part of the building. This is very critical because this actually was altered with pen tile in here at some stage, stuccoed over, roofed onto. So we're taking great care to keep all this intact while this work is going on. You can see here again, this is the, the old borders with that old storefront being removed. And then this is that interior of this void. Again, this photograph is about two weeks old. We came across, there's a basement where my cursor is right now in the foreground. These were these um, seven foot high, long, I guess you could call them chases <laughs> um, that extended not only here, but over here as well. Some very odd um, existing uh, structures that we discovered. And here you can see, this is what we call E-line, which is actually the south exterior elevation of, of the Paseo. So it'd be the north elevation of the courtyard. And you can see here, we have temporary shoring to hold up all of those trusses that were part of the old San Bisco shopping center. It is now part of the main spine of New Mexico School for the Arts, which we call the Paseo. And then there it is. Um, when we submitted this application last month, we had no idea what this was gonna look like. We knew from the interior, but because of the two-story building that, that was um, in front of it, we had no idea what we were going to find. Here you can see the old roof line here on the left. And here you can see where they kind of added pieces. This is the opening that was um, mentioned as far as adding a new door here, exterior door. Here are these two openings that will need to be addressed with the reverberation of this facade. So this is what it looks like this morning. <laughs> um, as you can see, it's completely cleaned out. We've, we've been bringing in um, engineered fill. The basement is completely mitigated um, and, and removed. Here again is that west facing facade of what we call the gallery. And again, you can see where we've boarded up that opening here and the two openings at the attic level that we'll be filming. And then I'll just flip through these. I just wanted to give you guys some context. Um, here we've had to rebuild parapets that had to be removed because they were substandard construction with the demolition. We've enclosed the structure here. So this is basically the east wall of this void. This is the north wall. And this is the area where the proposed cafeteria will be placed. 
And then again, this is looking west. So the cafeteria will go into this void. This is that northern section of the old borders. And here we're just looking at that, that section there. Here you can see the, the old front of the borders. And here it is. We removed that kind of tacked on storefront um, that was there before. So um, again, here's our floor plan. This is the main entrance to the school. This is the parking area here. This is the, the void that was the result of the approved demolition. Here's what we call our E-line. It's a structural E-line, but this is the exterior wall that was approved with the demolition approval in November of 19. This is what we call the music wing here. So this is, um, this is what we call the music corridor and then the music, lab, music wing, music lab there, just for context. So this is our proposal. We have, um, what we're proposing is about a 7,500 square foot cafeteria here to serve the school that is directly accessed from the Paseo, as, as well as this music, um, music corridor hall here on the west. This is the main entrance here. And then we have a connection here from what we call the kind of the music wing piano lab here. And then we have about an over an 8,000 square foot courtyard that is a result of, of, of basically using up this space here and keeping an open space that allows that paseo to then again spill out. The idea is to create a real sense of porosity between all of the spaces, the gallery opening up to the courtyard, main entrance of the school, the paseo, the main spine spilling out to the courtyard, the new cafeteria connected to the paseo, having the music wing connected to the cafeteria. So this cafeteria can serve kind of as the heart and center of the school. Um, not only for obviously uh, for meals, but for um, assemblies, activities, events uh, with the Art Institute and having just that opportunity for NMSA to have an outdoor space. Um, currently, there is no green space for the students to hang out on. And so the idea is to have a nice, big, open, flexible lawn space in here. So that's just a blow up. You can see here that we have a very expansive lawn space. Single, it's one level for um, flexibility. Um, we do have a grade change from east to west on this paseo. So in order to accommodate that, we have a raised area here with stamped concrete that steps down, which then can actually be used somewhat as a stage if there's some type of a student performance, impromptu, um, you know, graduation gathering, assembly, back to school evening with parents and friends. Um, and again, opening out with um, storefronts coming out to the courtyard. And then these openings here between the cafeteria and the paseo completely pull back to again, allow for flexibility. So as, you were, as most of you are very familiar with, this is the front facade of the New Mexico School for the Arts um, that was completed in August of 19. Um, you can see here that storefront here um, and so really we wanted to just play off the elements that have already been approved that are already integral to the design and so that we're being consistent with the architecture and the forms. This is the north elevation of the school. This is the visual arts area. Again, the storefronts opening up and with, as you can see, utilizing the approved um, gray panels. Um, here you see it in a horizontal orientation. This is our palette of materials that we're playing with. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel with the new cafeteria. Um, obviously restoring the brick of the gallery, utilizing the, the gray paneling system. At the old Sambusco uh, massing where we removed that wood storefront, continuing the brick coping along that entire parapet to restore that mass to what it it may have been within the news. There's limited documentation of what that looked like, but allowing that stuccoed mass to read as its own. Um, and actually this is brick and then these are tiles actually. Um, and then of course, you know, stuccoing it, continuing the stucco color that's there. Um, Lisa mentioned in her staff report, utilizing um, horizontal thin shade structures um, along that south face 
of the Paseo, which is the north side of the uh, courtyard, to um, assist in some um, solar um, um, gain in there, creating some fun patterns on the ground inside and out. And again, um, enclosing the courtyard for security reasons with the, the uh, gate and fencing design that was approved previously. So these are some just some colored uh, renovations or excuse me, renderings of the, um, the proposed addition. This is, and I do have these blown out. So I think what I'll do is I'll just go through these very quickly. Um, this is the existing facade here facing east. And here you can see the cafeteria in the, in the back. And then this is that restored elevation of the old borders. We call it the music wing. And here you see that same elevation with the fencing along here on the south. This fencing is to, again, as I mentioned, to secure the courtyard for safety as a school. Um, there are plans to move forward with a dormitory in this area. And at that point, this would be modified and that application, of course, would be coming before you as well. Again, you can see this is the elevation that Lisa had in her presentation. This is basically the, the main piece of the cafeteria with these little wings on each side at a lower elevation, allowing for these glass walls to completely open up and have, have flexibility between inside and out. There's our um, west elevation of the gallery. And here you see, this is the um, elevation from the south. That's that Paseo south facing exterior elevation, what we call E-line. There's the old borders where we're restoring that brick coping. And then this is with that security fencing. So just going through these, I'll go through these quickly. Again, these are just some blows of what I just pre presented. Hard to get this long, these long full elevations in one shot that's not at too small of a scale. So these are the architectural plans and, and that are in your packet as well. Again, just reiterating what I just presented to you. Um, but again, I just want to point out that this piece here, here it's with the fencing, here it's without. This is a section of the cafeteria that is currently, it would be visible uh, from the east elevation if you were standing very far back. <laughs> And here's a zoom in again. So this is this was the existing elevation prior to demolition. Here you can see that two-story building that was at the back of the gallery. All of that's been removed. Again, restoring that extend not restoring but extending that coping pattern along the parapet there, where the old what I call the old um, borders. And then here you can see it with the security fencing. So this is the south elevation. This is the elevation that was approved in November of 2019. And um, so basically when this was approved, the previous team and architects in our phase one had not really vetted the program and the connection between the Paseo and the courtyard and the cafeteria. All of that had not been designed yet. So as we've been working with SMPC and our team, this is the elevation that works with, again, with having that flexibility between those two spaces here. And I'm gonna move on so you can see it a little larger scale. And where my cursor is here, that's where that horizontal, um, basically um, shield will be going across here to help mitigate some of that direct south southern exposure and create some fun patterns on the ground, interior, on, on the interior as well as the exterior. So this is the entire south elevation that was approved in November. And then this is what we proposed here. You can see that the cafeteria addition is filling in this area in here. And then this is a section that would be exposed to the courtyard. This is the east elevation of the cafeteria. Again, as Lisa said, this is the, the, uh, the top of this structure is about 20. 25 feet, two inches. And then it steps down to 20 feet on each side, tying into the um, similar um, heights of the existing structures. And here's the restoration of the gallery facade. This is the, um, the, uh, the west elevation. 
which um, you can see this existing west elevation area here. You can see the, uh, the gallery there. And then this is with our cafeteria addition. You can see it just barely there in here that it does protrude a bit up, um, but you can still see the, the very distinctive brick parapet of the gallery. And then this is the north facade existing. And then this is with our addition. You can see that the um, cafeteria is back in there. It's very hard to see. So with that, um, I do want to, I know it's late, so I want to leave as much time as possible for any type of questions or clarifications that we may provide. Um, but that is uh, the plan for the new cafeteria and courtyard for the phase 2A for NMSA. Well, thank you, Colleen, for your very thorough presentation. Did any members of your team that are present want to speak at this time? Um, I, Eric, Eric, would you like to say anything as the head of school? There are two Eric's there. Okay. Yes, we have we have Eric Kreitz, who's the head of school, and we have Eric Meese, who's our our lead architect. So it's Eric C and Eric K. <laughs> That's how we can decipher the two. Um, Eric Kreitz, do you have anything you want to say as as part of head of school? Sure. Um, good evening. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, do I need to be sworn in? Sorry, I was watching the procedures with the other groups. Yes, please. Okay. Melissa? Do you swear? Yes. Do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Eric Kreitz, C-R-I-T-E-S, and my address is 11 Sendero Alto, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Kreitz. You have the floor. What do you want to tell us this evening? Sure, I, I, I don't have uh, much to say other than that I just wanted to thank you all for uh, considering our application. Um, we're very excited about adding a cafeteria and courtyard space to uh, our school, it's, it's an essential component of one of our great strengths as a school, which is our community. And so having the space to not only provide food service, but to have performance and engagement um, and all sorts of other school activities is gonna be really essential. So I thank you all for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kreitz. Okay, I'm gonna see if board members have any questions or, I mean, yeah, questions or comments. Uh, board members? Maybe they just all want to go home. <laughs> okay, let's see. Member Katz. Um, really nicely done. Um, and I can see how it really enhances the circulation and the way it all works. The only question I have is the height of the cafeteria where, you know, it does sort of like pooch up a little bit above from the south and the west and the north. And it, how necessary is that those additional few feet in the cafeteria? Well, um, um, member Katz, um, board members, Madam Chair, um, I will say that, yes, um, the height of the proposed, let me get to the enlarge. There we go. So the height is, is that 25 to 25 to and a half, I think, to be exact. Um, we have not fully engineered it, so we're, we are in design development right now. Um, but the key part, and I will have Eric Meese, our, our project architect, um, address this as well, um, if I leave anything out. But I think the key with this, with this volume is that we're trying to create a space, as I mentioned, that is um, multi-purpose. The key, Purpose is obviously a cafeteria because currently the school does not have anywhere to, to prepare food, to serve food, the kids eat, eat their lunch in the paseo at some a few tables and on the floor and we're on steps and wherever they can find a spot. Um, I, I've, I've witnessed it over the course of, you know, since I was involved in October, since October of 19. And, um, but I think what's key is that they, let me get to this. 
apologize. Let me get to. Here we go. I guess it's, it's not. Okay, you can see here where my cursor is. I apologize. I've got two big screens. So I'm having to lean over. You can see here the roof of the cafeteria actually is at a, as a slight slope. And so the key is that we have to tie into our parapet heights at this west end. And so we're tying into existing parapet heights, which because this is an old building that was added on to over and over and over, nothing matches, which is what we have found in our demolition. Um, even this uh, south facing parapet of the old borders actually steps up. It looks like about four to six inches in a random spot. Um, so we're having discussion, do we just leave it as a, you know, the quirkiness of the old structure or do we resolve it? Um, but we're, we're trying to tie into existing parapets at our low point. And then we have to provide an adequate, we want a low slope to really open this up and speak to the courtyard visually and, and as a volume. But obviously we have to have a minimum slope for proper drainage. And so that's how we got to this 25-2. And um, Eric Meese, would, would you like to um, add anything to this? Um, <clears throat> not really. Uh, do I need to be sworn in? I can yes, you I do. do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> do you swear under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. Eric Meese, uh, 908 Avenida Salito, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the committee, I, again, thank you for this opportunity. The only thing that I would add, I think Colleen has done a great job of pointing it out, is that, um, yeah, it, the opportunity of bumping that up also gives us the opportunity to bring a little bit more natural light into that place, into that space. That space currently only has windows. If you could look at it in plan, uh, from the east, so by actually elevating that center portion, we get an opportunity to bring in some natural light from some clear stories above, um, which will also help. And then also, if you if you look from the east elevation from Montezuma, you know, although it does seem like it does pop up the gallery building, there's a there's a drop in the topography as you go back west towards the cafeteria. So it actually drops about three feet in elevation. So the the gallery building, which is that brick building, the prominent building there on the east facade, will still very much be the, the prominent facade of the building and the, the, the cafeteria won't take away from kind of that um, presence on Montezuma Avenue and from the east. And then, you know, and it creates an opportunity that as you do come into the courtyard, there's this kind of gem uh, that's inside the courtyard, um, which is slightly different, but that's all. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, Member Guida. Uh, thank you everybody for the presentation, Colleen and team. I, I think this is this is really great. Um, uh, I, you know, I see here tonight a design that's consistent with uh, the rest of the project, which I, I view as tremendously successful um, in terms of solving this problem. It's a, it's a very straightforward and smart design that leaves a really nice courtyard, which we, we on the board always knew it was going to be a part of the project in the long term, so I'm happy to see that um, tonight. Uh, I, I had two questions. One, and Colleen, I may have missed it. The the fence that encloses the courtyard. What's what's the materiality of, of that? Uh, yes, member um, Guida, uh, board members, Madam Chair. Um, here you can see in our kind of materials palette. You can see this here. This is the, the fencing that was approved in phase one that's currently on site um, to the east of the music wing. Um, and so it's, it's a, a metal a steel frame that's in a bronze finish with this rusted perforated panel. And cool. so the plan is to use that same pattern. In fact, we've kept the existing fence. Let me see if I can. Hold on a moment, let me get to, so you can actually see it here. We have actually been able to with this crazy demolition. Cleaner has done an amazing job in, in meticulously taking apart this puzzle of a building. Uh, but you can see 
that's the fencing here that is still in place. We have three very mature trees that are very healthy. We have one that wasn't so healthy that is gonna have to be removed. But we wanna keep these and this courtyard. So uh, the plan is to keep the fencing here in place. And then basically you can kind of envision it. This is our courtyard kind of in the foreground. That fencing will then have an access gate here and then continue kind of where the dumpsters are on the truck, kind of where my cursor is. So um, the idea is just to continue with that same material. That enclosure, as I, as I mentioned, will be temporary. Well, not temporary, it's permanent until we move forward with phase 2B, which would be the dormitory structure that would be placed in that existing um, parking lot that's to the south. Got it. Thank you. I, I like that fence detail a lot. Um, the, the other, I, I initially, in looking at the elevations, I shared Frank's concern about the height of the, the cafeteria volume. Um, and, you know, the elevations show its its true height relative to the to the masses around it. But the, the, the perspective that you have of the courtyard um, really solves a lot of that problem for me. Um, and I realize now that it's really not a problem. Uh, the the height of that volume I, I think is important in, in terms of and Eric brought this up in terms of celebrating something a uh, feature in that courtyard um, and unlike the the elevations this really shows that this is a, a dimensional gesture it's a glass box uh, we can imagine it being lit from within at night um, it has a sunscreen that's 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 in front of it um, and so you know, in terms of scale, in terms of statement, um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, just shading and 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 letting light into what is becoming a very deep floor plate, I think this makes a tremendous amount of sense. And uh, I know that it really won't be visible from behind the building or or outside of the courtyard. Um, so I, I think this is a really successful move, and I, I like it a lot. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Wita. Any other board members wishing to comment at this time? Let's see, Member Larson. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with, with Anthony and that um, I think this is a really beautiful addition. And I think it's really clear that there's a very much a need for it. Um, I like that it kind of, continues to echo the surrounding architecture um, in that area. Um, I, I think that this is gonna be a really beautiful space for your school. So congratulations on such a nice design. Uh, thank you, Member Larson. Any other comments? Any other members wishing to comment? Uh, it appears not, I'll, I'll give you a few of my comments. I think this is a very, well thought out project. And because of the different architectural styles here, uh, that you have the historic buildings and you have other buildings there that are of different um, architectural styles, uh, you, the designers, had freedom to um, create something that would be compatible, but yet stand out on its own merits. And I think, in my view, you have accomplished this. And um, so I wish you good luck. And let's see, uh, I'm going to open it for public comment. Just a minute. And it appears there is no one else that wants to comment. So, uh, well, you heard all our comments and we're not gonna make a formal motion or anything. And I, I believe the comments that were made were favorable. And uh, let me see, Member Katz, were you wanting to say something else? Yes, I think that um, as far as I'm concerned, I would rec I, I think it's fine, um, but I think that we need, the board does need to decide whether it wants to um, engage in further conversation or whether they think this is, is, is it. I think there maybe should be a motion that we accept it and uh, don't want to make any further negotiation. I mean, the, the procedure is that we have 60 days, we could talk about it, we could then present them our problems, but I, I think 
it sounds like we're ready to um, basically say, we recommend that this go forward. Okay, let me ask Lisa, we have to do that. if she had indicated that we just review and comment. So Lisa, for this to be more substantial um, in reference to our comments that were very favorable, uh, can we go ahead and make a motion? I'm gonna to have to ask Sally, I, I think you can make a motion. Um, I, I believe that the role of the board here is to recommend to the city um, whether or not further discussion is needed. And do you just say that in a statement or in the form of a motion? Maybe. Well, we have to decide that. Sure. And, um, it would be a form of a motion from us that we recommend that it go forward. I, I, I think that's appropriate. Okay. Thank you uh, thanks for the suggestion. I think it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, Mr. Katz, you have the floor and will you make a motion? I would make a motion that we indicate our approval of this design and that we recommend to city council that it go forward. Thank you. Is there a second to this motion? Members, somebody? We do seconds. Uh, who was, oh, we do? Okay, member Wida seconded. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, member Beachay? Yes. Member Bolivanu? Yes. Member Wida? Yes. Vice Chair Katz? Yes. Member Larson? Yes. The motion has been approved. Okay, thank you. And Colleen and company, uh, thank you for your presentation and good luck, luck on the project. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for your time and, and staying up so late. <laughs> we appreciate it. Okay, we're almost over, friends and neighbors. Any matters from the board? Oh, yes, silence is golden. Um, I adjourned this meeting and I think it's about 11.17. So members, I do want to, uh, members and staff, I do want to thank you again. Um, I like the fact that you're a very thorough board. It does, you're not a board that's looking at your clocks or your watch to make sure you get out of here. You want to make sure that you, you give a good result to every project. So I thank you for that. And staff, thank you. Did a good job. And all of you board members, go to bed. <laughs> good night's rest. Okay. See you in a couple of weeks, or is it three weeks now? Three weeks. Okay. Night uh, say Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.